Hey, what's up? Welcome to Basecraft. So, I actually have two gigs this week. I already did one at the weekend in um, Garbo's in Castlebar, and it was really good, actually. It was a good atmosphere. People um, are starting to get used to coming out again and coming out of their shells, and yeah, it was a good buzz. Like, they were cheering for every song, and they just didn't want us to go off the stage. Like, they, we just had to run off the stage because they kept asking for our encores, but all these gigs have really strict um, times and all this for them and uh, I'm doing a stream tomorrow in Cork so yeah that's pretty cool two gigs in one week that's like crazy it's like a, a tour or something but um, today I'm talking to Simon Francis and um, Simon is a master at the effects and it was funny while I was editing this I actually said I was going to sell my HX stomp this thing here in my hand and um, funny I've actually got into it a lot in the last while so I started making some cool sounds with it so I'm going to put one at the end of this just before the podcast starts, a, set, a preset I made. If, if anyone wants it, just send me an email. You can have it for free. It's no bother. It's probably crap anyway, but it's, I was just kind of showing what you can do with this pedal, how out there you can go with it. And um, yeah, so Simon is a master of the effects and um, he's featured on like Juan Alderete's uh, pedal show and everything in America. He toured with um, Ellie Goulding for like eight years and he also was the bass player on a few tours with um, Kylie Minogue. And he did loads of kind of the synth parts on the bass. So he, he he's very modest, but like he would be up there with Janet Guizdala and Tim Lafave and all those people. I'm, I'm butchering these names, but they're not e easy to say. Also, I saw today that Nate Navarro went to see him when he was on tour because he wanted to learn some of his tricks. So he's up there with all these guys who are like FX masters, tone alchemists. So you can see this is a long one. It's a two-parter if you're listening on a podcast app. But you no, know, we just kind of hit it off and... I'm into the effects, but I had a lot to learn from him. And just his journey, his bass journey was really interesting. So, uh, as you know, I don't cut these short. I just let them go. And, um, yeah, was delighted to have him on. And he lives in Belfast, so hopefully I'm going to call up to his house there at some stage and just record a little episode going through pedals and messing around and that kind of stuff. So, hope you enjoy it. As usual, like, subscribe, especially just like this on wherever you're listening. And uh, that helps me out a lot. And, uh, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. versus tiger <laughs> i know well i'm like it's either that or like my shiny bald head so <laughs> no, sure. like, i feel like i've not got the same sort of like nice soft focus lens thing that you've got going on though so oh my god that took me nine months to figure out how to do that really? with, wor with workarounds <laughs> <laughs> it was an absolute nightmare trying to figure because they're not those uh fancy cameras they're not supposed to be left turned on for 30 minutes for more yeah. than 30 minutes so you have to do a load of hacks to trick the camera into staying on for more than 30 minutes. Oh, really? So they'll just sort of like auto off? They always turn off. Uh, and even if you have a battery, it won't let you use it for more than 30 minutes. So you have to do a, like a load of stuff to trick the camera. And there's loads of people online show you how to do it. So it's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's why I've, I've, I've avoided <laughs> And stuff as much as yeah. I can. I think you're better off going down the rabbit hole of learning about pedal, bass pedals, and audio yeah. software than cameras. <laughs> I mean, sometimes <laughs> it's definitely like it has its ups and downs. So yeah, what's going on with you, man? I think you've been busy with a lot of production, have you? During all, during the last year. Yeah, like, it was. Yeah, because I mean, I guess it was like everything live just sort of ended, um, and I was sort of in a weird. A weird break anyway I think sort of end of February early March I'd sort of stepped away from my time playing with Ellie Golding had come to an end so I was sort of in that what's next <laughs> space and then a pandemic came along <laughs> is that so, normal um, in the session world that um, a gig will come to the end like is that it's kind of comes with the job you get kind of booked from tour to tour don't you yeah, I think so. I mean, like that that gig was a weird one because I was on it for I'm trying to think how long. Like I was on that gig for about eight years. Um, that, it's a long. And scene. like that that was relatively unusual. Um, and like the drummer and guitarist on that as well, they'd they'd had like a decade on the gig. 
Mm. So it was it was sort of unconventional in that sense, in that certainly other pop gigs that I was aware of at that time hadn't really held on to their bands as long as that. They'd have been more changing. But yeah, it just sort of... It, I guess it's like part and parcel of the thing. Um, and it just sort of reached reached its end um that sort of thing happening so i was sort of in that thing of like walking away from like what had been like the main kind of everything else i'd ever done had always sort of worked around that so it was like yeah. any other gig i'd done there was always a little bit of like you'd get like the band assemble siren would go off and you'd sort of drop drop whatever else you were working on and kind of return to that gig so it's been it was that sort of thing of being like oh now's the time this probably comes to an end and then the pandemic comes <laughs> it was like it was a bit it, in some ways it was quite nice because it allowed a bit more space to sort of work things out um it's terror yeah, that's so your I, that's your red and butter like so it was probably terrifying to think that it would come to an end but yeah yeah i mean i think that's also the thing it's like working out that like there's there's that thing of like knowing knowing when to like walk away from a gig which i'm not sure like I'd ever really thought about um, mm. or like knowing when when sort of a project has seen its sort of course and like I think for yeah. everyone like there's that thing where you know and you might it, that's not necessarily to say it's like a full stop and you wouldn't return to something but I think there's that thing where um, like that I guess that system that exists around that project for a time has maybe achieved what it can at that point and maybe for the betterment of everyone it's kind of that thing of moving on but I think like as a certainly like starting out it's that I guess like I got that gig in that was like my mid-20s so it's also that thing where it's like uh, up until that point it was like I just need to get the gig yeah so my focus had always been on getting gigs <laughs> never, <laughs> never that thing of like it does there ever come a point where there's maybe an appropriate space to be like oh actually my time on this is done it's time to explore other things so it's been like this weird sort of forced forced sort of removal from all of that from all the stuff that I sort of was comfortable with and um like I've been living in Belfast for like almost 8 years now as well. So it was also like but I'd never been around town really because mm. I was always touring. It's a nice city. So, it's a really nice city. Yeah, I and I love it and it's and like now I actually have friends because <laughs> it was like before it was like I knew people and and I knew like a handful of people had you know like one or two good friends but in terms of like the music scene or anything here I had sort of no real kind of um involvement or like uh connection to it really oh, how did you I end just, up in Belfast what was that how did you end oh, up how in did I, my wife I, got, I was thinking I, I that it's, it's always the, the woman or her partner brings yeah. you to these places where you know nobody <laughs> yeah it seems to be that they like it's almost like people go out and collect people and then they bring them back so um <laughs> yeah we we were meant to be here temporarily and then um we had a, like we had our first kid and um and then it was just again like I was touring so much it just made sense to stay here where we had like family support mm -hmm. and we were in London before that and the cost of living in Belfast was sort of significant to the point that like the commute just made sense it kind of in fairness when you're on a big tour it's just one commute meet the band yeah. and then you're all together gone for a few months yeah. like. I mean that was it so it was sort of like yeah it just made all of that easier and more affordable for us and then I was able to like in the gaps it you know flights were always quite affordable so it was easy enough to like to jump over to London for like odds and sods of things and doing bits with friends so yeah so it was that weird thing where I sort of lived in this place but had never really properly properly engaged with it and it sort of like teetered around the edge on it and then I think like the last couple of years I'd, I'd had a bit less time I think I worked out the other day it's now been like four years or so since I've actually done like a proper solid block of touring like I've done like little short runs but mm. um so I think in that time I'd sort of start to make more relationships and then that meant that kind of again like helpfully like weirdly it set me up quite well for the pandemic because it meant that there were a bunch of kind of creative relationships here and just friendships that I had time to like invest in and um and then really fortunately for me that kind of led to like a load of really kind of satisfying creative projects and a bunch of like production and recording work and um 
yeah like i've been really lucky to have bits of sort of external like remote sessions as well and things like mm. that so it's been it's been that thing of just sort of like treading water and trying to stay afloat but sort of in the midst of that getting a sense of um like i think like loads of musicians you all like it's rare i think that you ever get someone who really just does does one thing and doesn't want to at least dabble in other things mm. so it's been nice sort of to have that forced space to no um, it's a really interesting point you make even for myself like i've been in an original rock band for 10 years and not that i ever thought that i do something else but now that this happened it's like oh this is what life's life without my band yeah. and it's a bit shit <laughs> yeah but, but i'm making the best of it you know but at least now i've seen what it's like not being in the band and um being out on my own and doing it my own stuff but it, it's like great perspective for everyone you know you, you can see yeah. you see something that you probably never would have taken the risk to see you know yeah i sort of had that thing where yeah i'm like i could have never have afforded to have chosen to not tour for a year and yeah i could exactly. i couldn't really afford not to tour for a year and in fair of all it, people as well you're really well set up for this crap because your class at technology like <laughs> there's some well, musicians that mightn't even have owned an interface before the lockdown and then people were like we'll do a remote session i don't even own a laptop they could have been saying <laughs> i definitely felt like there was a bit of that hustle at the beginning of everyone sort of like oh shit we've got to find a way of like of making this happen and yeah i mean it, it yeah it's been like it it has been good it's that difficult thing of like not wanting to be glib about it as well and not sort of try and be like oh but a great year um because mm. i definitely <laughs> haven't in lots of other ways no. but <laughs> but it's like i guess it's like that thing of i guess as humans we're like meaning making machines aren't we so it's like that thing where something like this you your brain sort of scrambles to make sense of it and try and like and if certainly for me it's like if i could hold on to my mental health for long enough <laughs> yeah like i know that i'll sort of be able to level out and and sort of figure out something from it and i don't like one of my big takeaways from it is like performance and like playing shows like i just miss terribly mm. um and i realize even like in the studio i'm sort of constantly seeking um opportunities for performance in that so whether it's like like just setting things going and creating a bit of chaos and trying yeah. to like respond to like if there can't be other if I can't be jamming with other musicians or kind of in a live, you know, environment of having that push and pull with um, other musicians on the stage, if I can set up synths or effects pedals that will push and pull against what I'm doing and forces me to sort of pay attention and, and perform to and with them, I think I realise a lot of how I operate is, is sort of focused around that. And so that it's been helpful sort of identifying that and being able to scratch that itch but like right now I'm like I just desperately want to I've not even really properly like jammed or played with anyone oh outside of again sort of outside of a studio context of it being like right mm. there's a song we've got two hours make it happen and like yeah and I really enjoy that it's really fun but it's a very different thing to you know having spent like 15 you, you know like 15 20 years or whatever of like solidly I, you know being like a bass player it's like the moment you sort of pick up a bass you're immediately in a band because <laughs> and like, anyone one few root notes and you can play a song and they yeah. can't find a bass player yeah if you can pluck like an open e you're done like this yeah. is it you're made so <laughs> yeah so i think it's like having that taken away and like okay i definitely so i have that thing of the last year being like oh could i could i just do studio stuff and i'm like it's fun but i think for me there's a vitality of live stuff that i'm like no i definitely want that to sort of continue and yeah i'm sort of getting increasingly sort of anxious for that to return but you know there's not really i don't think there's any way of predicting when that will properly like yeah, you'd, burst you'd even, forth no way and you, i actually <laughs> might have a gig in northern ireland in by the end of the year but uh, you'd, oh, miss, you'd miss the oomph of the the amp like even i never plug in my pedal board at home i'm always just like using the laptop or whatever but yesterday i don't know i was watching some of your pedal videos so i said i'd plug in my pedal board and <laughs> had the amp turned up and i just loving the oomph of like the big muff and oh, it's yeah. just you just can't compare to having a real amp vibrating air and just no. making the sounds yeah i had like well i, I ended up 
like typically I got a new like amp and speaker setup during the lockdown like the first one <laughs> and um which I'd got for sort of other other projects that I was meant to have over the summer last year <laughs> so but I've got like the um I think it was like the first one in Europe like the Mesa TT800 Mm. so I have like this 800 watt amp <laughs> oh, which is like the loudest amp I've ever owned <laughs> have it on like a point two or something like barely turn on the volume yeah like I've like I've been using it as a preamp at home because mm. it's got a really nice um, like tube DI output on it oh nice yeah and it sounds great um, but I, I, that's all I've used it with and like with headphones and um, like the studio I'm in it sort of exists it's on like the mezzanine floor of a warehouse for like a live sound production company so like a few months ago i just plugged plugged everything up and turned it up really loud in the warehouse um <laughs> and then i think it was thursday i brought everything in and we have like a little live room and i just i set up my amp in the live room and just lay on the floor <laughs> like, <laughs> i was just playing notes just just to sort of like i just had a quiet day so i was like yeah. oh, i just want to i had that thing i was like i really miss the sound of like a loud mm. amp and I was like, I'm just gonna like turn it up and like lie on the floor and play it and just feel <laughs> feel yeah. that again. But so. you react to it like even when you have the loud amp with the distortion, especially or um, mm. fuzz, yeah, get all those harmonics, extra harmonics above the sound, and you'll just p- play something completely different. Usually yeah. something a l- maybe a bit less complex because you're reacting to all those harmonics coming off the fuzz, which you won't really do if you just have a pair of headphones on and a fake distortion sound yeah yeah i could probably do like i feel like i'm so used to that <laughs> like I, I don't know if you ever have that thing where like you think back to when you were like younger or first starting out and i remember sort of having that moment where i kind of had a bit more focus on wanting to make music like a thing that i could try and do in a way that would sustain me mm. and like getting really into like Victor Wooten videos and like being like I've got to learn if I'm going to be like I I went through this whole like I need to be a chameleon phase sort of thing yeah yeah and um and I had all this facility on the instrument that I just don't have now because it's like my my sort of career has pretty much just been playing one note through a ton of effects (laughs) and just and just having like a really rich sound so it's like you just play one note that sounds massive and it's like I I always have that thing now that when I finally turn all the distortion and the effects off, I'm like, oh crap! Like, what do <laughs> this I play? One note doesn't sound as good as it used to. Yeah. Well, what do I do with all this space? But I was reading um, that you did uh, like a Kylie Minogue tour, and mm. you did all the synth on the like. Well, there was no actual synth player on the tour, and you did all of it on the bass, or was there also a synth player? Yeah, so there was like a synth player doing keys and um, all the obvious key stuff, but all the synth bass stuff, I just co- kind of ended up covering on bass guitar. So we, the beginning of that tour, it was for the her album Golden, um, which was like the previous one to the most recent one. So it was, was it 2018 maybe? Um, and the initial run of shows were like small, like the smallest venues she'd ever done. So it was like um like gorilla in manchester so like you know sub a thousand sort of capacity mm. spaces so the stages were small so at the beginning there was sort of chat about me having a synth um and then it just became really apparent there wasn't going to be any space for that um and there was a discussion about that being on track and and i was like oh i'd really like to i'd done like a few like with I guess over like the eight years with Ellie Golding, it had been like I'd just progressively done less and less with the keyboard to the point that like I think I'd only ever really play the keyboard if I was I'd do a lot of like playing a synth line on the keyboard and playing a bass line on the bass sort of thing so like yeah. sort of tapping it with yeah. with okay. my fretting hand um, but with Kylie's stuff I was like actually it's so distinct like the, the bass synth stuff is all all there and I know that um, Deshaun, the bass player who'd sort of been on that gig, you know, for sort of the seven or eight years preceding my kind of time on it, he he'd done a lot of effects stuff. So, but yeah, like it's that thing where you I arrived on the first day with this pedal board like the size of a table. <laughs> <laughs> I remember like the front of house guy was like, oh, "That's a big pedal board," and like I was like, "Ah oh, shit, I really need to." Um, 
make this happen but yeah but like when i sort of walked away from that gig it was it was like a mate you know the front of house guy was like i never had to touch your eqs or faders mm. or do anything with you at the thing and um yeah like managed to cover all the bass synth parts just with yeah the bass and pedals which was it was fun like it that was the like i think that felt like the the first time i had like properly walked into something and been like it was a, that was like a whole new camp for me really i didn't mm. know i sort of loosely knew some of the people christian galena the like the, who's the keys player and like band leader um i knew him a bit before and one of the and the two backing singers i'd worked with before but everyone else was sort of new and the m the musical director and that steve anderson i hadn't worked with before so everything else i'd sort of done before before that with lots of effect had been with Joe Clegg who MDs Ellie so and he and I do a lot of work together yeah yeah it was like really I assist you. him in his stuff so anything we've ever played on together I've always had that like he knows um he knows what I'm trying to do um but it's a really different thing sort of going into somewhere and being aware that someone maybe has no like understanding of of what I'm attempting to do so mm. I've that was definitely the first time I felt that pressure of being like this needs to like from day one be like I mean and that gig was like I arrived on day one and it was meant to just sort of be like a set up day and I think like Kylie had been in Cuba or something like recording a music video and they were like oh she might pop in and say hi and then she popped in said hi and then was like right let's run the set and it was like day <laughs> one <laughs> and I was like great I was like, and it, I'd had like maybe a week of like prep for the whole thing so Mm. it definitely felt like but yeah so that that was like that was really fun and that's sort of been my um my sort of personal war against like bass on track (laughs) (laughs) and what was your uh, process for like i suppose you listened to kylie's new album and then you just had your ridiculous pedal board out at home and just trying to figure out how to emulate because i assume the parts you're emulating are just keyboards since yeah um yeah i mean it's it's sort of like uh, i'm not really doing anything particularly new like i i feel like on i guess on like bass forums and stuff years ago there were loads of people kind of i guess looking for synthy sounds on bass and talking about like octave fuzz envelope and so for me it's all sort of come out of that and then so i guess like ear training so um on like prepping for a gig like that or I guess any of the gigs I've done you'll get sent like the mix track and then generally you'll get sent like stems or multis um with everything sort of broken down um which is really helpful so you can listen to kind of things in isolation and work out how everything relates and so it sort of just comes from there and I do a bit of I guess like with anything I've got certain like sounds and palettes that I go to um so there was like there's a sound that was in the like purple line six but the fm4 um Mm. it was like the like the same time as like the dl4 and there's like a synth string patch in that which has then been like everything line six has made ever since and like that's like my go-to if there's anything that's like sawtoothy like reese bass sort of thing or like um, so like that was like pretty much that sound is what I used for like the chorus of Love Me Like You Do with Ellie Gold like that that was pretty much the sound that like, mm. made with a bit of modulation um, so there's things like that that I'll kind of go to and and as time's gone on before I used to really focus on creating like like all the really try and get all the microscopic details of what was maybe on a record but I think as time's gone on I sort of feel like actually having a palette that you draw from on live stuff is like, I don't know if you've ever watched like videos of like Shaka Khan live um, doing like Ain't Nobody and it's like Mm. no one ever plays that on synth. It's almost always on bass guitar. Yeah. But it sounds and like feels just as good as the real thing. So I think there's also that thing of, for me, there's been that learning process of knowing like just how much of it to recreate or. Yeah, exactly. I don't um, need to get that, that exact synth sound. I've got yeah. this killer bass in sound that is just going to be brilliant live and no one's going to care. Yeah, so it was like, and I guess like as an example of that, there was a song on that record of Kylie's called Raining Glitter. 
and it was like it it was like this really like chewy um almost like sinewy like synth based thing and this real like greasy flavor and mm. i kind of got to a point of really having that sound done but it playing it just didn't feel you know, the way that 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 sort of effects chain was working wasn't didn't feel very satisfying and so like i guess as an example on that one i just ended up using like an envelope filter and this sort of detune effect and a little bit of octava underneath it but just a lot of dirt and so it was this mm. really quite dirty but tight bass sound and it was like that was one, like one of those things where i remember we played that song and it was like everyone sort of lit up and was like oh that's <laughs> and it's that sort of thing of being like oh yeah like sometimes it's there's that degree of sort of interpretation and it's still like when you listen to it compared to the record it's that weird thing where its functional role within the mix is the same mm. um and so i think that's more my focus and i i guess like with lots of practice i feel like a lot of it happens intuitively now like i'll sort of hear a sound and i think my ear and i guess like my audio memory or whatever has that thing of being like oh there's that sound oh, i can get that with this and with this and like i mean like now with things like there's like the panda midi future impact and like the source audio c4 like with things like that it's like you know it is a full synth pretty much so it's mm. you can approach that in the same way you can any sound design but it's a lot of the time on pop records you're not even talking about one sound it's maybe like five five things layered on top of each other so some of it is like trying to work out how to do that and so sometimes like sometimes even with like a Moog bass sound you're just best off just playing clean like I've I've sort of had to learn that where what are the times where actually for the performance and for the energy of the song actually just moving it to clean bass sometimes you would never know that it's yep. not synth um, in fairness live like as well it's a difference between you know when they're mixing those CD those songs they're being mixed to be heard on a phone speaker mm. but like when you're on a stage and you've got thousands of watts you can get away with pushing out all that bass and so yeah and I think like especially at like I mean it's it was different that to with Kylie being smaller venues but especially as your venues get bigger and your PA systems get bigger like the battle to have to be able to hear the note of a bass guitar is like and I I think I guess I probably should have prefaced all of this like I the front of house engineer with Ellie Golding a guy called Joe Harling was massively instrumental in me being able to make all of this work because it was mm. I he had ears that I just massively trusted and we were able to kind of foster a relationship where he was honest with me and was like sounds shit if it <laughs> yeah. did um but I was able to kind of let him know what I was trying to do and I remember like really early on he was like I don't really know what to do with you at bass and he'd come from like the gig he'd done before that was like Michael Kiwanuka so he you know he'd been like very clear band roles and and I kind of was like you know you just need to think of it like a synth and so we we had a lot of back and forth of working out where where the frequency range was available and um because you sort of like especially as I guess at that point I sort of got involved in playing for Ellie as she was sort of ascending in bigger venues and by the time you're doing like an arena you know mid-range starts to go mm. out of the mix in turn like to kind of give space for the vocal and it was that I couldn't have I think without a front of house engineer to sort of reflect back on what was and wasn't working and like a lot of my signal chain sort of developed in response to that um and like i ended up using well i'd used like a dod meat box before and then when mantic brought out the density hulk i moved to that and so i always run that as like a parallel path so that's sort of the first effect in my chain but it only it sends out the sub to like a separate di line and essentially what that meant is because there was always that thing where we were like working with front of house guys before and it would be like well, I need clean yeah. and I was always like well, there's no point in me sending you clean because you're just kind of going to get a bass going bonk, bonk. Mm. but the sound is like wop wop um, <laughs> so yeah the, you don't want the clean coming out you want that crazy yeah. sound but sometimes you need that the modulations of that sound particularly in a, in a larger venue 
maybe where you'd normally use like a low pass filter for that you maybe want a band pass you want to cut some of the lows on that because actually if you're sort of filter sweeping a really bass heavy thing in a in like a big venue it'll just swamp everything and it doesn't it sort of won't work in that mix you don't have the same control as you would I think you know mixing or recording something whereas the density hulk meant that I could under something like that if you still needed that weight I could have something that's purely creating just massive sub frequency mm. and that can be controlled however the front of house engineer chooses to which then gives me that freedom above it to have um, essentially like thinner synth sounds that, that will respect the mix more or find those places of cutting through but I yeah so I think like it's definitely not like being a and you know that then meant that you know it's totally that groundwork that again like having a musical director like Joe Clegg who let me explore that and and had a similar sort of drive and passion for destroying backing tracks um it, it <laughs> meant destroying that there was like that venues. environment to foster it you know uh, and when you're on those big pop star gigs would you need to learn like a big repertoire like I, I doubt it's like being in the E Street band it's like <laughs> this is the set list for the tour and that's what we're sticking to or would would some of those big acts throw a, a you know a curveball and be like i'm playing this album track <laughs> from like 10 years ago tonight i mean it was i think with with ellie that's been, i guess that being my like my primary experience of that that was very particular because it was like i came on board in album two so it was like there was only really a repertoire of like 20 songs to learn which wasn't which was kind of easy enough and then as it's you know I was sort of there then as the next album came out and as other releases came so all of that stuff you were sort of learning as you went and your brain sort of hold you know holds it kind of loosely and so there we we'd have like I remember we had like I remember actually <laughs> we had like one one like festival and as we were walking to stage like Joe the MD turns to me he's like right we're gonna do we're doing this song tonight everyone and I was like oh shit like what do I do in that song and the song started and it was it actually it was one that I was like I know I know in the verses I do like these sub drops on the bass guitar with an expression pedal and I was like but I do something on the synth and I was like but I don't know what I do on the synth <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember it hitting and I did this sub drop and I played a note on the synth that I thought would be the right note and it was not the right note and I just sort of slid up and down the thing yeah, just yeah. hoping to find the thing <laughs> and so <laughs> i feel like the most of the first <laughs> yeah like in the most of the first verse i was just like doing this oh, and then when the chorus hit everything sort of clicked into place and i know like, oh, where i am now and like, we walked off stage that that like night and i was like guys i'm so sorry about first one of mm. and like no one was like what do you mean it sounded great <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she didn't and do I a go, james brown on you and she's like <laughs> I'm, yeah. Simon, I'm docking you 50 quid for, for that I know. luckily like, everyone thought that it was like I don't know I was like I just remember doing it and I was like oh shit I've done it now I sort of had that mentality of like oh, I guess if you play like a mistake over and over again it becomes intentional Yeah. so yeah. Um, <laughs> that was how I faked, faked that moment um, but, um, but yes like when I went on to Kylie it was I was just sent the new album to learn and then there was like a handful of older songs um i guess like the, the sort of like the greatest hit so mm. but it really like the the initial run so i was sort of booked for this kind of initial like underplay small venue it was all around the album release run and we were pretty much just performing that record for the most part and then within that were some like rearrangements of you know things that like can't get you out of my head and spinning around in a in sort of the like country disco world that that record was in but then like night one of that tour <laughs> like the crowd requested a song and kylie just started playing it and i can't even remember what the song was but i did not know it <laughs> and, and so it was just, just like the guitarist uh, hands or something like that yeah like it was totally that i mean in like um christian galino the keyboard player on that he he like as he again sort of like co MDs that with Steve Anderson and he he acts as band leader in that so he sort of is able to like we had him on in our ears on the mic but um it was fun like I in like in previous lives 
that I've lived I've done like a fair amount of that sort of like I I think like I had when I was kind of younger I grew up going to church and a lot of that was you know you did a lot of like off the cuff like people just sing a song from a multi-thousand song repertoire that it's assumed that you're familiar with um mm. so I think I got quite good at working out how to blag that but that felt like a very sort of like being thrown in the deep end of needing to sort of draw on that skill again um <laughs> that's where you cut your teeth wasn't it doing that um christian contemporary music yeah so like my my sort of first forays into like being paid to do music were yeah was like was ccm stuff and like some praise and worship gigs um and it was like i think like i i sort of had that i guess like as you grow i you know i sort of moved away from that world and ha had a bit of that sort of embarrassment about being involved in some of that industry and there's definitely like an ugly side to some of that or certain you know certainly things certainly things about the way that that world operates that don't align with um some like my ideology and, and values but i think mm -hmm. i think that like moments like that i really realized that um the tool set that I gained from that has been invaluable. Um, and I think even just being used to sort of needing to find like an immediate um, rapport with a bunch of musicians and, you know, that sort of experience of being able to play every week with different musicians and there being enough of like a shared sense of some repertoire, but, and like particularly like the expression of like Christian church that I was involved at, it was a lot of there was a lot of like improvised kind of moments of music within that as well so like I think that really kind of stretched those muscles that have been mm. yeah like really valuable for me so yeah like that was yeah as like a teenager playing bass it was like playing in church on Sundays and then like playing in punk bands with friends in the week that's class like, though you were getting both schools you were getting like how to be a rocker and you're getting yeah. a, more, a more academic thing in the church like yeah and then like and then having that thing of like i was always trying to bring like uh, like fuzz pedals and synths into the church so which was always like sort of received with like varying degrees of <laughs> like suspicion and sometimes like real acceptance but um i remember like i remember got like i got like my first filter pedal and it was like the um electro harmonics like enigma cue balls thing oh I yeah big massive like, thing huge footprint yeah and everything. And like I love it, I I think it's a really underrated filter, but I remember like setting it up and I've been playing with it at home on like I think I'm probably on just on headphones and doing like filter suits with it and I was like that sounds huge, yeah I'm gonna do that and like I'm gonna try see if I can like do that and like in church on Sunday and there was like a song and it was like this sort of like mellow atmospheric -y thing and I was like oh yeah some like deep synth bass swells would be great here. <laughs> And like the resonance was just so high on it. And I just, my earphones just had not been able to like impress upon me just how much low end was being generated. Oh. And I remember like the subs under the stage just shook and a bunch of the mic stands just oh, fell over. <laughs> Summon the devil. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was like, you know, maybe some people will think it's like some like move of God or something. But, <laughs> um, but that like, that like I mean like even like that moment was one of those I was so excited by that um that, that like you know those were all sort of the beginnings of like wanting to like pursue exploring those sounds more and um yeah but it's yeah like that stuff has definitely then been helpful with like learning repertoire and being able to sort of blag your way through songs that you don't know and um I guess you sort of learn I guess like a practical music theory that allows you or my experience is like you gain from it some sort of intuitive sense of being able to sort of predict where harmony might go mm. um which is really helpful and is again like not one of those things that I'd ever really sort of cognitively considered and then I think it's then as time goes on and you maybe chat to other people and like how do you do that and you're like oh yeah like I probably have this thing of I'm aware that if the melodies will sort of a well structured or well written song the harmony and melody will sort of move together to lead you to where where it's going to go and it i think it's that thing of if you can if you have enough practice you know yeah, you hear it in your ear like even if you can't explain it like if like i'm only 
dipping into it more myself i did a lot as a teenager and i had lessons from um a drummer he was just doing theory but like with all you know secondary dominance and that they mm. usually go to the fifth chord they go up a fifth like there's there's a formula and even yeah. if you can't explain it and you've been playing music enough you hear it in your ear and you'll hear yeah. where these things go like yeah i think we're so like you know all that stuff is so familiar it's like even if you don't know what you're doing you sort of it's kind of what you'll end up doing anyway so i like a lot of that's been really helpful um and it's definitely i think allowed me it's a, it's been a, like a load of skills that have been really helpful as at like working as a session musician to sort of understand those ways that you yeah i think just the importance even of just kind of having some degree of connection with the musicians you're working with and um because it's what like it's wild sometimes like you work with people and, and people just don't understand that um you know like it's hard to make music being performed on a stage by a bunch of musicians feel and sound good if people don't feel and sound good hanging out with each other yeah like, um <laughs> I think that's such an important part of it. So I think, you know, I think things like that were, were always sort of, that was helpful to learn and and to be able to like, I think it also meant like, you know, the punk bands I was in or um, like all the own bands that I had with friends, it was like, we were all like the same level pretty much. Like we'd all, we'd all learnt to play at the same time and we were all the same age. Whereas it was like, for me, again, at church, it was like, you don't know, you know like there were drummers and bass players and guitarists and keyboard players like again it, it, i was really fortunate like at the church that i was at there are a number of musicians who were working professionally within mm -hmm. various contexts and so like it was like i could have died i could have been like jamming with my friends that week and like come out being like oh i'm the best musician in our band or whatever <laughs> and then like <laughs> on sunday like i'm playing with a drummer who can play polyrhythms with every single limb and i'm like yeah. oh shit hum i that's, suck that's, hum <laughs> that's humbling at least like, yeah but isn't that like an old adage the best way to get better is to play with people who are you know are above you as a musician oh, yeah because they're like, always like learning and chasing from them like you know yeah i'd always rather be like the worst musician in any given band <laughs> like, <laughs> and like in fairness i feel like that i've again like i feel like, like definitely when i walked onto like the early golden gig i was so intimidated by the other mm. other musicians and it was like i'd not i'd not really done a gig of that level before then um and yeah like it was like the joe on drums and like chris ketley the guitarist and the, the keys player was a guy called max cook and the three of them were just like yeah they're like those know, musical director people they're super yeah. they like they know your parts they know the drummers the bass everyone's parts like yeah i mean and that is the thing like all three of them like and i think that again that was sort of the unique thing about that gig actually the like, all four of us in the band but when i kind of came came into that i i really sort of just i viewed myself as a musician and i before that oh like and like as a musician i really just thought of myself as a bass player and i dabbled in like bits of production before then and bits of writing but that had always been in like bands I was in and and I'd done like bits of things of like maybe helping out like local bands or other people but it was never really anything I was like I could do that for other people and then walking into that and there being sort of like three musicians who could all like who's you know like production chops were all to like a good level they could all play multiple instruments <laughs> really well <laughs> and like <laughs> and you know they were all attractive and like all like really well groomed and it was like i like even like, it was all of that sort of stuff like i remember sort of like working in walking in on the first day and a lot of the gigs i'd been doing before that had been much more um like indie alternative kind of gig so i had like this my beard was a bit unkempt and i'd been wanting to grow out my hair i remember like really early on i was like looking around and i was like oh shit i should probably <laughs> tidy I mean, myself like, up what would they call yeah. it, uh, what they call I mean, it? A, fr it was... a front facing industry especially yeah. when you're in a pop band you kind of you can't really come in with a, a ripped t-shirt and a pair of shitty jeans <laughs> like ellie no, Goulding is there like looking amazing the rest of the band look unreal and you're just there like <laughs> scrolling yeah that that definitely was like i definitely felt that and had that like oh maybe i shouldn't be here um and then yeah i mean like that sort of reached its apex so like there was a point i think on the first u.s tour i did i was like <laughs> i'd got so sort of like 
tired of like I sort of felt this vanity sort of uh, growing up in myself so I ended up just shaving my head on the door because I was like I'm tired of worrying about my hair and yeah. needing because everyone else was like I was like man like everyone else is so like well put together and I was like I, that's just not I was like that just wasn't really me at all I was like I just sort of you know and just throw whatever on and um so I was like I'm just gonna shave my head and then I grew it grew it really long and then and then I was balding so now I just shave all the time which suits me quite well although it's more like it's higher maintenance than I thought it'd be but um but yeah like, I mean that it was really intimidating walking onto that and then it was the same I had the same thing with Kylie as well it was um the level of musicianship on that gig is wild and mm. um and I really was aware of that and um a lot of the gigs you know I'd I'd kind of done Ellie and I'd done like little bits and pieces in the gaps and um but it'd been a lot of the other stuff I'd done again it'd been had been so effects heavy um like I'd done a bunch of stuff with Becky Hill and doing sort of dancey stuff which was so much fun like doing all like the big like FM synthy dance bass lines on a bass mm. guitar but none of it was that complex to play and it was coming on to Kylie where there was that disco funk Stuff her music is fun for bass like it has yeah a, a good uh a whole high tempo and some co really cool bass lines yeah i mean and like bass lines that really drive the song and mm -hmm. so for me i really was like oh man i'm gonna be so exposed on this um so <laughs> yeah like i but it was great i learned again like i learned so much from you know the everyone on that in that band was like i mean christian the keyboard player has maybe the greatest pocket of any musician I've ever worked with regardless of their instrument just his his sense of time and where he sits around it and um, I get that, that was probably the first gig that I've worked on where really the rhythm section is drums, bass and keys um, you know and it's all those sort of like clav or Rhodes parts or really yeah. quite percussive things and it, that sort of having that synergy and Tom Meadows the drummer on that is just he's so tight and it you know it's all that disco like pretty much four to the floor and that kind of electronic informed stuff and his sort of attention to that detail and the way that he builds drama and tension and opens up drum things even though the pattern maybe isn't changing there are these ways that the energy ebbs and flows and being able to sort of yeah i i kind of came away from that and learned so much and um it was nice to sort of feel like i got away with it <laughs> and, <laughs> and um i'd say that's amazing but it must have been amazing i uh, like d do you ever just stop and think i can't believe i've so i've seen some of the gigs you did like and there's to be <laughs> hundred thousand people or something like, do you, d did you just take it all in your stride but i was also thinking uh i saw a video of you with one how do you pronounce it one alderetti oh yeah one alderetti yeah was that almost more of a pinch me moment sitting in oh. chatting to him than playing to a hundred thousand people that because you're like this someone from when you were a teenager that inspired you and you're just sitting yeah. there chatting to him about pedals and playing the bass that must have I been mean, as big yeah. as seeing 100,000 people yeah I mean it, it's to be all of that stuff feels really surreal yeah I mean like those, those gigs of that size are, are, are mad there's a weird like there's a weird sort of like not detachment but there, I think when um, I would get much more nervous playing in like a small like pub sort of mm. gig venue because you can see everyone and like if one person isn't enjoying the gig that's like 10 percent of the audience <laughs> my experience <laughs> and you can't the see the, the audience at the big gigs because the lights yeah. are so bright <laughs> yeah and i think there's something almost like chemical that happens when you have like a hundred thousand humans together it's sort of like that one person not having a good time you know you can always find someone who's having the best time of their life mm. um but it's definitely so I think sometimes actually the danger the danger of like the big gigs is it's really easy to almost sort of like dehumanize the crowd and sort of not not really see them as people anymore and it's a, it's just a crowd mm. um and I think if you don't sort of I guess both helpfully if you sort of just engage with that any sort of sense of fear or nerve sort of go um and yeah like I guess like for me that it did get to a point where it was so sort of normal and regular and it's the op it's the outside stuff where you can actually see the crowd like whereas when you're playing like an arena gig with the lights and stuff 
you can't really see the crowd um and so um, like you can feel the energy um but it's more that whereas yeah like, i mean like the one thing was wild i mean like it was yeah like he'd been i le- i think for me growing up it was like the big my kind of big base heroes were like uh like the two like real prominent ones for me were like justin Meldal johnson and and one and both of them their sort of use of effects pedals and creating sort of interesting sounds and that like really kind of creative approach to their instrument was just a massive inspiration um for me and really have I've essentially built a career on ripping them off and <laughs> um what do you sorry to have him invite you on his tv show yeah That's i mean like so, that, cool. so i think like we connected on instagram or something and then we we'd message back and forth every now and then and i was always like this is mental yeah and then um, you're trying to be he, cool to talk to him oh hi how are you <laughs> but you're saying but, to your wife this is unbelievable <laughs> yeah it was i mean that was totally it and then he was like i think there was one time he's like oh you're gonna be in la and i was like yeah and he's like oh man like come and hang out and um so like the first because i've done like two interviews with pedals and effects and like the first time that first one was the first time i'd met him in person and it was like he was like i'll come down to my studio space and i sort of arrived and he was like i don't want to talk to you too much I want to capture that like that yeah. sort of it's like doing so, this mean, it's like you, you can't have a conversation before you place record you just yeah go. yeah so it was I mean and it was wild because it was like walking in and it's like him and then Nick Reinhardt's there and and in terms of like for me two really you know both of them are so kind of inspiring creative forces um yeah and it was just mad sort of being sat there in the room and and sort of having that chat and and having that moment of realizing like I think in that video I did the thing where I showed one how I use the density hulk in parallel to like a micro synth with a chorus after. Yeah, that's what you were showing how to retain the low end or something. He was really yeah. interested. He was like, "Whoa, that's clever." And it was like I think like he texted me like a couple of days after that and was like, "Dude, I just did that at a gig." <laughs> and it was that thing where I was like, "This is really weird." Yeah, that there's this sort of, um, uh, yeah, that 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 relationship shifted to that and you know that and it you know that kind of got to a point where you know anytime I was in LA I'd have I'd have seen him and hung out with him and um and just like he he is like just such a light of like musical joy like I've Mm. not you know I've just not met I'd like again like I feel like when I was starting out doing session stuff I'd meet older musicians who were all just a bit jaded yeah that that's it was not, like that never is that inspiring is it like no and I, I always was like the like i guess like that first point i made at the beginning where i was like i never really thought about when to walk away from something i remember though like chatting to someone who was like in their 40s and hating music and i remember being like i want to quit before i get to there or like or make sure i never get there and i felt for like the longest time i really struggled to find anyone that had gone that far and then like one was just yeah like anytime i saw him or anytime i had conversation with him he was like have you heard this record have you checked out this or like <laughs> just there's like still that like vitality around mm. music that you know and like even like sometimes with like my peers and like people my age you'd like talk to people and you'd be like oh have you heard like this new like there'd be like a record that i'd have heard that i'd be really excited about and people be like, I have no, I, have, I know I don't really listen to music. <laughs> you stop. Li- everyone does that. You did a lot. Of, well, obviously yeah. you don't, but you kind of stop listening after a while. You're like, I, I just have these bands I liked as a teenager, yeah. <laughs> and I don't need to hear any more music ever again. Yeah, I think I maybe there's maybe something. I think as time's gone on, I'm like maybe there's something wrong with me. Like I'm like constantly like addicted to trying to find like new music. I think it's that probably that slightly sort of like indie snob teenage version of me (laughs) you want to be the first to find it before anyone else (laughs) yeah like i need to be able to be like oh the first ep uh that they put out independently is way better than anything else that i know you're at a party and you're like they don't even know what sample (laughs) this song is using yeah i mean they definitely like i remember going through that phase of like yeah like being obsessed with working out like where loads of the samples were coming from and trying to like familiar my familiarize myself with that but i 
and sort of gave up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just you yeah. went down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, but, but um, even talking about Wan, what I think what kept him probably kept his fire going is he he kind of ju- wasn't he in like this prog met racer x is that what they were called yeah but but then the mars volta is like a prog rock band and the guys in it are probably 10 20 years younger than him and like yeah that was a completely fresh band different type of music so he was fearless in that way to go and do a project that was completely different to what he was used to yeah i think like oh, someone's just coming to the studio um Um, sorry that's just right. in case someone walked in um yeah i think i th- i mean like i th- i wonder with that stuff like i also imagine like part of the reason of him being involved in that is because of that vitality as well like i wonder if that was like you know i just think him being sort of able to hang in that was because of his sort of just how switched on and engaged he was and is with everything um and that like almost like i think having been inspired by his musicality i think then to actually sort of spend time and to be like oh actually that sort of just like life vitality like i feel like from him i learned so much about just maintaining a passion for music and like he tours so well like you know Mm. like he'd have gone out with his bike and would have you know and i i definitely went through like almost sort of slightly depressive stages of touring where it's really easy just to like on days off just stay stay in your hotel room and it is need like, to de- you go de- into yourself like. or... yeah i mean and like i like i'm like i like i'm introverted by nature so it's like especially like especially for me sort of like probably the first 20 minutes after coming off of stage i really just need i just need a bit of time mm. <laughs> time to just sort of like regather my energy um not that it's not like it's that weird thing i have that real buzz but i definitely sort of come off of it and just need i want to sort of be able to enjoy that buzz and have like a little bit of time just to myself and so like especially like then on like a day off on tour having been in like the venue tour bus thing like sort of having that space can be really exciting to be like oh i can just be in this space i don't have to interact with anyone um, <laughs> Do you know what i did on the last tour we did in spain and i know social media can be a load of bollocks most of the time but yeah. I, I decided to make a story for the tour and everywhere we stopped i'd walk around the town and i'd take pictures of all like oh, statues great. and the fountains and whatever was cool like and then by the end of the tour i had this story that had nothing to do with well there was musical bits put in as well but it was just this really long story for the whole yeah. tour a story for anyone who doesn't on Instagram it's like a reel of pictures that you, you can save forever so yeah. that was just something that kind of got me out and walked around like you know yeah I think that I definitely sort of hit hit a stage in touring where I just realised I was taking it for granted and then like and then you sort of have that thing of being like I'm travelling the world and like and people would be like oh amazing like you're in this place and I I never like fully would just spend the day in, but they they definitely with a I definitely remember having a tour of being like I've been in and like partly it was because it was like oh I've been you know I sort of had that real sort of like like just that weird attitude of being oh, I've been here before and and I think it it maybe lasted like a month or so and I remember sort of chatting to one and 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 I just was like oh man I just need to reconnect with um actually just being present in in like the places that i'm in and um and it was you know that was so much better to do and and it was that like i i then would take like a skateboard around and would do a lot of like god that's that's um, dangerous simon skateboard yeah well like i mean it was the like, tour, tour manager was always like you're gonna break your wrist or your <laughs> collarbone and you're gonna be out of action and i was like oh it's just like a I was like, it's just a cruiser deck. I'll be fine. And like, I, luckily, I, <laughs> I was fine. And like, I but I through that I sort of developed a bit of a rhythm of like being a total like coffee hound. I'd like try and find like a a real hip coffee place wherever I was, and mm. generally there you could find people that would give you sort of tips on places to check out. And um, then we ended up like there ended up being like a fun little then like sort of days off ended up being like a bit of a posse of a bunch of like band and crew and we'd all sort of go off and find like nice walks and like nice food and like i mean food became a real big um that was like a real big drive and um just finding really nice restaurants or 
and and just sort of being able to kind of get back in and experience the touring thing because I think it can be really easy to really easy to just sort of you know on those big ones just to stay in your hotel or and on like and I've definitely been guilty of it on like splitter tours and stuff where you know like actually getting beyond the venue and and like you know the the like the itinerary on on like a splitter tour is just cra you know it's wild you know and you, you're yeah. like packing and unpacking the van and you're all sharing drives and like you arrive at the venue and you maybe have like three hours between unloading the van and sound check and then you maybe have an hour between sound check and a gig if you're lucky yeah you know and i think for me it's been that thing of just in general like trying to get to a place of whenever i'm in those things actually trying to like force myself to <laughs> go out and experience yeah, or, the, or even, the world that uh, i i often think like back in the day like how did these bands take drugs and drink every day for like a six month <laughs> tour you'd be absolutely wrecked like no you'd be like if you get in the first flight home i'd be like oh i can't like it's it's hard enough without drinking and acting the maggot the whole time yeah yeah i don't know like I never really drink before gigs and stuff like I don't know how like and even then I'm like I drink <laughs> I had like a phone call from my GP the other day like I, I like I, it had been like seven and a half years or whatever living here and I've not been registered with a GP the whole time I've been here and obviously like when the when the vaccine was coming around mm. it, I was like oh crap I'm gonna need to register and they they kind of called up and were like just like general health check and they're like how much do you drink and I was like well at the minute not much but I was like, but there was a time <laughs> touring and then you sort of have that moment where I recollect and I'm like, man, like, because you sort of like, I like, I almost always, I mean, I was sort of like raised in like the house of like, never leave your plate empty. Mm -hmm. And um, I applied that to <laughs> That's the That's a terrible uh, attitude <laughs> yeah. for a musician when it comes to drink like that. <laughs> yeah. So it was a real like, yeah, like, so I kind of adopted a sense of like, never leave the rider empty. And, <laughs> and, um, you know, you know the space between finishing a gig and getting on the getting on the bus or going to the hotel or getting in the van. It's really not that much time that I'm like. I think like, it. I don't. It never was a. It never was a problem for me, thankfully. But it definitely, definitely, I'm like, it definitely wasn't great. And I, I think some of my actually kind of um, reconnecting with being present to touring in the places i was going part part of that was actually kind of not not drinking all of the beer and whiskey on the ride of the night before because that will be like i sort of started to think i was like oh alcohol might give you like a fun night but that's always like that's always the repayment is paid the next day oh god yeah and, you pay um, it in double yeah um, but yeah with interest um so i sort of slowed down a little bit on that and but I don't know how people like, I mean, like I know people that are like, oh yeah, like, you know, pretty much from the time they get to the venue, they just drink. And I, I'd, I don't think I could do that. Why do they even put alcohol on the rider if the band, <laughs> like, it's like the temptation. It's like yeah. me, I just did the shopping before we did this. And I don't, I generally don't buy loads of sweets and chocolate because I eat them. Oh, I'm yeah. a fiend for it. Like, um, would it not be easier just to not put the alcohol on the riders? I know you're you're missing out on that, but the te when the temptation is there, like you get, you get in trouble. <laughs> oh man I mean like I mean it's that difficult thing because there are times when it's really you have those really fun nights where you know there's those like blowouts that happen in, and the intensity of like the touring life is like it's those nights can be really good fun but definitely there there are also those other nights where it almost feels like you're like oh I don't want to don't want to waste the ride <laughs> but, <laughs> oh um, yeah that's your like teenage mentality it's like yeah you're used to playing for for nothing for a few beers so you're going to drink them and you can't yeah. oh, man, you're, like you're trying to, to lose that <laughs> yeah like it's totally that thing of like showing up at like a club and being given like your tickets for like three cans of red stripe and being like i'm gonna get all three cans of red <laughs> yeah. stripe or um, even cheese and try to get a few extra <laughs> <flag it. laughs> yeah yeah sort of like work out if if any of the other bands have been careless with their tickets Mm -hmm. um, or get your beer but don't give the ticket and then you'll have yeah. like one spare <laughs> yeah but um yeah it's i mean like it yeah it's funny that stuff again like actually having that time away from touring and reflecting on some of that stuff i was like yeah, i definitely was, was probably 
at a time was drinking a lot. Um, if if you were American, you'd be considered an alcoholic. Like if you're, <laughs> yeah. that's the way it is. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. I mean, definitely like it's yeah. British. It's sort of like if anything, like I was never really binge drinking. So sure. <laughs> in, in Ireland, like um, if you say it's considered binge drinking if you drink more than if you drink three pints in one sitting. Apparently, that's wild. But, in Ireland, oh, wow. if you you'd be like getting cheered out of the pub, he's a hero. Yeah. He only had three pints. Fair play to him. Like, <laughs> it's just a different attitude. Like, yeah, definitely. I mean, I we at the beginning of actually the beginning of the first lockdown, um, we I kind of we stopped drinking alcohol because sort of at the beginning of it, it was a bit like, oh, like we'll make this like you know try and make the best of it. Let's treat it like a holiday. And then you're like, well, I'm pretty much drinking gin from one p.m. every day. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like because the summer here was so amazing last year and it was and it felt like it started from like the second week of lockdown and and it was sort of like just sitting sitting in the garden like drinking nice beers and um and then there was sort of both that sense of being like oh this isn't going to end soon and mm. probably need to stop spending all this money because <laughs> yeah. i'm not making any money <laughs> not and on, then also the holiday is thing. over like need to get <laughs> yeah. some and like definitely then having that thing of being like yeah i'm not sure i need to be um and like definitely like now sort of i was actually like i went out last night to a tap room um which is like my first time actually going out anywhere in belfast in ages and um it was like i had like I had like a couple of beers and it, it was like immediately was like oh I'm really feeling this or even just being around yeah. people that you don't know yeah. is a bit strange you're like who what, it, you're claustrophobic like you know yeah it's I I, I had like um, when was it I had like my first sort of like bit of work again at the beginning of April just assisting on some stuff with Joe Clegg some MD work and it was in London and it was I'd actually been in London like I'd driven over to London the month before to pick up a load of old touring equipment that was in storage and uh, like bring it home and then I mean I really I sold I sold most of it like partly just to like kind of rebuild up some reserves and and it was that that thing where I was like oh actually I done a lot of this stuff you know it was lots of stuff that like had just been sat in storage for five or six years and yeah um and London was still at a similar stage of lockdown to Northern Ireland at that point so it wasn't that weird but when I went back like in April it was England had like opened up like pubs and stuff mm. and it was just the weirdest it was like I just was sort of like I remember like I landed into London City and then got the got the uh, taxi to where I was staying and um and I just was sort of like holding on I mean it was like the first time I'd been in a taxi it was like all that stuff where you're like <laughs> looking around and have that sort of slight anxiety mm. and I think that like night we went out and like sat in a like a pub garden sort of thing and I was like oh man like this is the first time in sort of six months or whatever that I've been in like a busy in like a busy public social space and um yeah it's a bit weird <laughs> <laughs> weird getting used to it again but not like but nice like definitely then realize that there's a bit of you that sort of gets some juice that hasn't mm. hasn't even as an introvert and... you need a bit yeah. of that interaction to get to boost you like oh man i like definitely like i think yeah like i de i definitely need like my space to myself for my for like to sort of regulate energy or whatever but um but like even there like i'm fairly like i think on the scale of like introversion extroversion i'm probably i'm fairly close to the middle i think it's like and for me speaking, it's that speaking slight of thing sorry go on Oh no! What were you saying? Oh no! So you were talking about spaces, like, and I was just thinking, you're, you're in, like, you, you went to a studio to do this podcast. I'm in my shed, which is, <laughs> a f which is five feet from my kitchen. Yeah. But like, do you do you, do you find, do you think that's better for you, like, to go to your workspace than having my situation, which I just take advantage of. It sometimes I'm like, ah, oh, you know, you just don't do as much work sometimes when it's this close yeah. to your house. Do you do you find? that space works for you like to be able to put yourself there like it's what i mean yeah it has i mean partly it's like i get at the beginning at the beginning of 2020 me and a friend had moved into a studio space in the town center of belfast um and i'd been going in there a bunch to work and just sort of explore things and then when the pandemic hit our access to it was kind of through a cafe which was closed 
and and the way that sort of our kind of very loose sense of tenancy of that space you know it was sort of one of those kind of like mates deal mm. sort of thing but it meant we had no access to it at all so I, I kind of took over a spare room at home as a studio space um, and at that point like I was mostly doing I'd not really I wasn't really doing any production or writing stuff at that point like beyond sort of like bouncing ideas around with some friends and um, but mo- like mostly I was just doing sort of remote base sessions um, and that was all like you know you just sort of need a base and an interface and then I did a bit of like I'd set up like an amp in my garage every now and then and once I'd sort of got the take I'd reamp it through an amp um, and that all worked really well but as things sort of like I have I have two kids so it's like <laughs> daddy what's like, that can I pull yeah. it can I play with that bass or whatever yeah and so it'd be like I, I had like a bunch of moments where I'd be really be getting into my flow or whatever on something and then like the door like uh, you know like my kids are like they're three three and seven so it is like particularly the three year old just like bash the door down and like it, he's in and you're like I was like oh this isn't this isn't great and I'm also just sort of taking over this whole room of our house and um and it and I, I have that sort I guess like I have that sort of like obsessive nature with with music and like particularly once like an idea has grabbed me um, I really struggle to let go of it and for me having then sort of a workspace at home I found it really hard to switch off and it's like that that thing of like you know I'd go upstairs to go to the toilet or whatever and it'd be like dinner but rather than maybe going down the stairs I would sort of lack the discipline to not just like oh I'll just duck into the spare room yeah, to have yeah. that idea <laughs> and then like the next thing it's like where where did you go <laughs> and, um so I think for me and then sort of things changed and then the space that we're in now kind of revealed itself um and it you know it was it's been kind of a massive help for me then to like I mean it's only like five minutes from my house so it's like I can kind of you know walk a cycle here or if I'm lazy drive which probably happens more often than it should um, that's class but like, yeah, five yeah, minutes like, is so handy like you know it's not like you're getting a tube across London or something to get to your space nah. like yeah like it is like just around the corner so it's and it's great and there's sort of like there's people there's been people around here so it's even that sort of having like bits of some social interaction and um, it's been it's been really good um, and I think for me it's worked having a space separate from home and it also just means like I mean uh, like all my stuff is not like littering the house mm. um, and kids I, like I, to like, break we, stuff we, too kids are terrible for breaking yeah. I, I was um, in a band with a guy a few years ago and he arrived to practice and when he opened his case it was like literally had about a hundred animal stickers on the frets oh man. And not damage <laughs> now no damage but like you know the, the toggle switch on a Les Paul they had like wrapped the stickers around the toggle switch and <laughs> just everywhere the whole thing was covered oh, in the stickers now it didn't do any damage but they kids just do stuff like that <laughs> yeah i mean like i think the kids probably made, like we used to, i used to sort of have like synth hour with them a bit every now and then and there's less of the keyboards and stuff around at home um so they probably missed that um but it, yeah i mean like i still probably there's still like a lot of my music gear that at home that probably doesn't need to be there um, but it's also like this space is, uh, you know, I've filled every like me and my the kind of my studio partner Lee, we both have like have a real tendency of like filling space. <laughs> so yeah, every, if you space um, there, you, you may as well buy some gear. Yeah, it's sort of like oh, there's rack space. We should fill that with something. Um, if there's some of that older um, gear, like it's really cheap because it's really big. Like because like yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, have a, I have a room rented in um, a charity shop. Uh, for practice for giving lessons and the oh, band great. practice but like a Wurlitzer came in for like tw- and w- you, I could have bought it for like 20 or 50 quid like it's oh, you know, the, mad the, the old yoke like because where like, was that it, where is that <laughs> down in um, Tipperary <laughs> you need to call <laughs> Which, me next time or like a happens. piano might come I'll in I'll jump straight for in the car you know what I mean like it, th- that stuff is so big people can't store it anymore so you can yeah. pick it up cheap if you can store it like yeah yeah there's definitely that sort of like 
yeah, there's that like sweet spot of, of being able to get a good price on that. Although like I feel like I've had a real like um sort of embrace of some like slightly newer stuff recently as well. Like I'm just like again, it's like dealing with like old stuff breaking. <laughs> like, yeah, that's so annoying. Um, Having broken gear is my pet peeve. I just yeah. I try to fix everything during at the moment, all my bases, so I'm going one at a time replacing yeah. bits. It's slow, it's and it's annoying. <laughs> oh man and it's like i and it's sometimes and it's finding people like my my sort of facility to do some of that stuff is okay but it's not great like i mean i i think i used to tour i had this like woolly mammoth clone pedal that i made mm-hmm. you made it cool. was it a, a kit off ebay yeah it was like a kit off of like i think like fuzz dog pedal parts or something cool i have one as well but it doesn't work properly uh, well i'm not, I'm not sure mine does it definitely <laughs> doesn't anymore and like i i remember touring it with with it and i remember there was a phase where every now and then it would sort of like cut out but i was like oh, if you kick it it then works again <laughs> and uh, i feel like that like is a pretty good summary of my ability <laughs> for fixing yeah, things I hate I'm, I'm good at the you know getting the bass to play really nice but yeah. i hate all the electronic stuff which is why i'm oh. going to go um i have a gnl there gutting out all the electronics i just got a ho- a honer headless bass from the 80s taking oh, nice out all it. the active electronics making ev- all of them passive because yeah. it's the only one i can fix like oh man that i like i yeah i don't i would actually i have like i have one active bass now but i never use and never use the electronics in it and they I, break I though have, the thing is they're not durable like all the active bass they have over time they have so much it's like if you the more things you have to go wrong the more things there are to break and yeah. when there's like 100 wires going everywhere in the cavity you're you're going something's going to go wrong yeah yeah i mean i i had this i have like a jaguar bass that has been like my real like um yeah i mean i've just like i've that poor bass of just like i mean like there's it's probably lost half of the like mass in its body because of it and now like it has like three pickups in it now mm. and um but it had like active circuitry in it which i just immediately gutted like yeah i think even before i ever did anything i just pulled it out because i was like i'm never mm. going to use it no um and again it was like for all of that sort of effect stuff that i that i did i guess like i've found and i feel like a lot of other people that have explored it have found that there's a uh, an interactivity between like passive instruments and that's effect funny. pedals that doesn't I don't feel always exists with active that's funny because I actually was saying that to someone and then they asked me why is that and I'm like I don't know I just found the active pedal the passive bases work better with pedals like. yeah I don't I don't know if it's I guess I wonder if it's like an impedance thing I don't know like that's the only thing I could think of I mean like I say that and then I have a friend who he has like an old like pre pre Ernie Ball like Stingray um I actually and, and I know like another guy who has like a pre Ernie Ball like is it the Sabre the one with two pickups and mm. both of them use those for synthy sounds and they like swear by it but like I think they do do a bit of like boost boost the low end of them and like like one of them he, he like particularly uses like there was an old um like Korg made a unit it's sort of like in the MS20 there's um there's like an audio to CV thing that like can turn audio into control voltage that will control like the pitch of a synth mm. um and it doesn't always work that well but this this guy John has the I remember he used to like gig around London and he had the Korg they did like a separate version of it which is a bit more refined but you needed a really specific like he had like this um like preamp and then and then the old sabre um there's another another bass player I called Danny who has this pre B music man that seem it like that really works and that seems to really work but I've never really had that same sort of no. success and and they're not so, as advanced uh, a circuitry as like a modern active bass yeah would have, they would have been one of the first one so I don't think they push the bass frequencies as much as a modern uh, yeah, yeah and i wonder if it is like i guess there's all that stuff of like their boost only and like there's all i guess it's like um i had like a brief phase of owning like a five string sadowski jazz bass <laughs> and like <laughs> during like during my sort of like session chameleon phase yeah and um and i remember like a lot of the chat around that was because that preamp is boost only it colors the sound so i 
I don't know, I definitely feel like there's a harmonic richness to a passive bass and there's a more it is it does feel more responsive. Um and the sound of it I just like more in general and like I I have this Yamaha bass which is now the like one of the BB it's like a BB seven three four A um that I have I have like these Delano pickups in and it's I mean like it's tuned for I I kind of got these Delano like the big pole piece pickups because I don't own any five strings now and when I got the call for Kylie I was like this <laughs> some of this it's I was like low. going through the repertoire and I was like oh, the bass player before me he had like a P bass and then a five string stingray and I was like oh probably gonna need that low note and I was listening to it and I was like oh it never goes lower than like a low C so I had this I already had this Yamaha BB that I'd been using and, and I was like oh I'll I wonder if I just tune that to C standard mm. I reckon that sound great and it did like the pickups didn't quite handle that tuning so I, I spoke to Delano because I tried like a Sandberg bass with those pickups in and it was really punchy and quite aggressive um uh, the bass actually like it would kill in like a metal band or something that would be like i mean it just it, it even just i mean the stock pickups are really the sound of that bass is really growly but it's more that in passive mode and so i've I've kept the active circuit in that but i keep thinking about like putting like a boss oc2 or something into it that'd be cool because <laughs> i saw um singray or music man just did a, a class oh yeah with, with dark um, glass dark glass yeah but is it really that musical to have the button on your guitar because like when you press it with your foot you can be more yeah. musical you'd be like the riff is coming in right now boom with your <laughs> foot but yeah it's definitely like a harder i mean i i i almost always have i'm not sure the last time i played without some bit of distortion on my bass so i think i always have some on but i'm not that it's like the alpha omega dark glass circuit I'm not sure I'd ever particularly use that as an always art. If it was like the vintage circuit that they have, I love that. I love mm. that one. And I'd often just have that on all the time. Um, there was like a, is it Base the World did like a YouTube video about the, the is it the Jupiter Effects Jive, like their tape saturation pedal. Mm. And he has like one built into his bass. And oh, I was nice. like, that I'd be down for. Like, I suppose they could put like, that in your bass really. Like the circuits are small enough. Like Yeah. I mean, I've thought about doing it, but I've never... This Yamaha, I think I probably will do it eventually. I just... I feel like it's... I'm not sure I have the skill set. And there's a few people I know, I think, that could do it. There's a guy, Neil Grimes, who has a company, NRG Effects, and I have a bunch of stuff that he's made, and he's just... I mean, like, it's worth, like, checking out his Instagram just for, like... He has photos of his, like, wiring, and it's just it's immaculate like it's just oh yeah you know every wire is at like S soldering perfect porn. It's angles like, i mean it's just like it? <laughs> yeah so i think like at some point i might but he's like down in the south of england he's like eastbourne but i think at some point i might try and get that base to him and i've i've sort of chatted to him about it on and off about mm. there's a guy in dublin that. makes his own effects pedals moose guitar yeah effects. i you have a bunch of his stuff as well yeah um i have like the nomad fuzz and then he had he did like a rusty box mm. um thing i have that i have a couple of moose things they yeah, they're amazing yeah actually i've not thought of talking to him um it's only down the cool. road you could get the bus down or yeah, <laughs> the train know, that's even. the thing i'm like just <laughs> jump on the train yeah oh yeah maybe i should do that so um yeah i kind of want to explore that because it's yeah i never really use active circuits um, but you've done like this kind of uh, R and D for certain pedals, like so. How does that process work? And I assume you get a free pedal at the end of helping them with the whole thing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've asked a bunch do. of people this, and <laughs> it's rare enough that the company gives. Like, um, had Josh Paul on this before, and he's the guy in the ad for that new Music Man. But yeah, you think you'd assume you're going to get a free guitar after, but sometimes they actually don't give you it oh really so he probably did i don't know yeah I'm just saying, i hope he did some people i've talked to have done stuff like um who was on uh this before um guy living in germany and he was doing um a Duesenberg bass really nice one and yeah. did a really cool ad for them but you have to send it back after so 
So you don't know. Yeah, I, don't... I, I wonder how often you get to keep the stuff. <laughs> I mean, like I, the, the most involved experience I had was with Hampstead Amp Works on the on the Sub Odyssey Overdrive, um, and like that was they they they'd already like made the guitar version, just the Odyssey, and we um, we like I was kind of brought in a friend of mine actually like they a guy called Tim Steer I'd done sessions with in the past and like we played in some bands together and um, he was working with them and he called me and was like you know would you be up for coming and helping us just voice this for bass and it was I mean like that experience was I'd not had anything quite like that before I've had I've had like companies send me stuff and be like can you try this out and give us your thoughts and your opinion um and and like I've had a bit of that stuff of getting in touch with companies and being like would you make anything like this and that's maybe spurred on stuff to be made but with Hampstead it was the first time I'd ever really sort of been in the room with the engineer and like Pete Hampstead who designs all those amps and like he's like a was like a like army radar technician or something and mm. like so you're sort of in their room and there's like this breadboard circuit and you're plugged in and he's like you know what do you think about that and it was just at the time it was just the guitar version and I was like yeah it's good and he's like right what happens if I change that so we played with all these like changing the EQ points on the on like the Baxendall EQ and playing with all the clipping di- diodes and you know that there ended up being loads of stuff about playing with things like input impedance and that's great it must be were, class seeing the process like you're, you're used yeah. to just you know having the pedals buying them playing them but seeing them being made like and oh he, man it was just like, like and it was like you'd say something and you'd you'd maybe describe a quality of sound that you were looking for and he just has that like dictionary in his head where he's like okay and like turns around <laughs> and like pulls some components out and then solders and you know and it's done within like 10 seconds and then you try that and you're like yeah and yeah i mean that experience was great and I, I i'm like littered with i have loads of prototypes of that um like i have a version that's like just like a modified version of the guitar one with sort of like flyboards attached to it and then a couple of like the sort of pre-release prototypes um and then not loads changed on that one like there was a lot of back and forth and then as that expanded we sort of got more people involved and and so like we sent sent some out like there's a friend of mine uh like Dave Baker who's a bass player in London um and he does like a lot of pop gigs and uses a lot of effects but he's like he's like not as I have a real fascination for like really filthy sounds and he's a bit more like um I'd say he's like more refined <laughs> mm. um and then that like there's a few people like that I kind of have other friends who then have slightly more like go wilder with effects and and so like we we sort of then on that point once we got to a point where it was good we pulled pulled together like a bunch of musicians so like we we sent one to like dev from idols to check out and then tim lafave and Juan, um just to sort of get people that would use it in different because the idea was it would be this sort of what hamster had designed on the guitar side and what they wanted to make on the bass side was a really um almost like a like make your own drive kit in a pedal so it's a lot of it is around the way that there's this treble and bass sort of backs and all eq that can be put before or after the drive um uh and like i i mean like i really want them to like it, it has like a clean blend i'd love to get a pedal that's two of them in parallel so you mm-hmm. could like because I like again it's like I I don't I don't use clean blends all that often you just um, have no clean just all distortion when you're playing yeah I'm sort of like if it's driving I'm all in and, um, <laughs> I know I, w- I wouldn't do that I'd always have the blend like to retain but I play in yeah. a three piece so I need to hold it keep it going keep up keep, fill up the sound I suppose yeah if you're in a band with a keyboard player or some other extra guitar they'll help fill out other parts of the sound like yeah I think sometimes you can yeah there's ways of getting away with it but i'd like yeah so i i've kind of i've checked i think they are like they've said they'll maybe try and do it at some point i think it i think that would be like a custom build although actually like i now have neil at nrg i sort of chat to him for ages about 
um like i had a boss ls2 and i I'd, and actually like the source audio aftershock their drive pedal like you can play around with having drives in parallel and i love that sort of sound of maybe with a big muff rather than having like a totally clean blend with it having just a really lightly overdriven sound with it so you're not you know you're not losing too much low end but and sometimes actually like your the low end out of a big muff is massive and so mm. sometimes you can get a bit of articulation and i think like the first thing i had built before that was um tom at cog effect i'd got him to build me these pedals called the he built me two of them called the black sun and it was like his 66 overdrive and his Tarkin like muff style fuzz and they're in parallel and there's like the muff is pretty standard and then with the drive there's like a, um like a high pass filter so like you could just have really bassy big muff sound and roll the tone down really low mm. but then have this really sort of thin weedy distortion on stuff on top and like things like that sort of sound on bass i love and it, again like some of that's like being like sort of growing up and you know it was like i remember like going like like local to me it was like bands like sixth would be playing and then like eventually like gallows and like a lot of that sort of like hardcore and like heavy music and i loved all of that and like being sort of going through a phase of just unhealthily obsessing about like over thrice and like all those like driven like ratty bass tones and, yeah and just being like <laughs> convinced that it would work in pop music <laughs> so it's like um and, and I, I feel like it's like I, I i i just love that that sort of texture and sound on bass and i love the sort of being able to blend blend them all together but yeah so with the with the with the subspace for um hamstead it was like we worked on getting the clean blend and we had a load of thinking about whether that would be like a low blend like something like the damnation mbd um and we just felt for that circuit the way that we were running it it worked better to just have a true parallel through that you could could blend in and and the way that that all works actually works really well um and it's really fun because you can do all that stuff of like you can have your EQ before the drive which is generally how I prefer to run it and like I I really like essentially just cutting all the bass and pushing the treble mm. and so the overdrive is just this really quite harsh thing and then you still have like a tone control that's after after your clipping so you can still roll off the real harsh high end and then if you just like I'll just blend that in really really slightly with the bass and I'd have that on all the time but you can you can also then do stuff where if you like boost all of the EQ and you have that set before the drive, you sort of hit the drive so hard that it turns into this weird sort of sputtery gated fuzz. And your um, your knowledge is like amazing with the effects. Like, <laughs> what, did you ever I, like, think of do, doing a master class in BIM? Like, because like I, I'm known as the effects guy, but talking to you, I feel like a complete <laughs> luddite. <laughs> Do you know, what I did. I did. I'm trying to think when it was in two. At the end of 2019, I did a couple of things at BIM. Like I went really, down yeah. and connected with some of the guys there, um, and did a. I, but, and we were talking about doing a masterclass, and then the pandemic happened. So this like, is BIM, I, BIM Dublin, was it? Yeah, BIM yeah. Dublin. Um, yeah, like I did a couple of days of like I sat in on a couple of the, um, like a couple of their like recording and like writing classes and stuff and. Um, <laughs> all I did was like I played I had some like recordings of some stuff I'd produced years ago but I also had like the demos of all the songs <laughs> and like it was that thing of like playing people the demos and then playing like the finished production version of the song and because I was like oh that seems like a really good way of maybe helping people engage with like because on some of them it was like oh we'd re there had been quite significant rearrangements that happened or like songs had been reharmonized and I was like, oh, this is quite a helpful way of being like, mm. can you hear what's changed? And I was sort of like, do you think it's better? And like, typically you're like, they're dealing with like a 19 year old. He's like, I think your production on that was shit. Like you've made the song worse. <laughs> really? <laughs> and like, Christ. I was like, do you know what? I think you're right. <laughs> and I mean, that thing of being like, but it, and so I, that was sort of like the context I'd done that in. But yeah, we talked about doing a masterclass and trying to work out. I was sort of trying to work out what, what i'd cover with that um i mean it's hard like the effects stuff is hard because it's like i i learned so much of it from 
I guess it was like Juan and Justin and then like Tim Lefebvre and John Davis who like from the New York scene and like Yannick was there, um, yeah. and then like in London it was like when I was sort of starting out there was a real scene of guys doing that as well like there's a guy Chris Hargreaves who played for like Alex Clare and like he does a load of like he plays for this group like Submotion Orchestra and he just gets these wild synth sounds and this guy John Calvert who was playing his bass through the Korg thing and like my mate Dave Baker and there's like another bass player guy Adam Prendergast who now plays for Harry Styles but like when I knew him was doing like noise noise rock and, and so there was I felt like there was this real sort of movement around me of like other bass players seeking weird sort of atmospheric affected sounds um and I really I just stole from everyone <laughs> yeah, that's how you learn like, and like, you know, your man is Steve Lawson another uh, English oh producer, yeah is brilliant yeah Steve Lawson well. totally yeah man like I mean like all of his looping and like his like textural like atmospheric just yeah I remember seeing Steve play and then there are all these people on like on talk bass and bass chat and like you ended up with like Shep who was like Panther Airsoft or whatever and like like all of those guys that like existed on uh, there was this real community on like those base forums of people trying out different gated fuzzes and different mm. octaves and different envelopes and I just you know just buried myself in that and just sort of consumed it all and plagiarized it all and like and really like I just happened to find myself in a platform and an environment with Ellie Golding where it was like like the context of me being hired for that gig with Joe Clegg sort of knew that I'd been experimenting with a lot of those sounds and I, I'd had some gigs that I'd done it in but it was like I think up until that point I was like mostly like my biggest gig had been with this like folk sister duo called the Pierces and it was you know like real like I mean they were real like Fleetwood Mackie Mamas and Papas yeah. folky meets like, kind of more traditional folk stuff and you know and they'd done like a record that had been produced by the bass player from Coldplay so it was all that sort of playing so I wasn't in that context I wasn't really other than like shoehorning fuzz and distortion in wherever I could of course it was like like, like kind of doing those I was doing those gigs with like yeah, a you need to be given the space to yeah and as well like uh, effects sound different in your bedroom than live yeah. so when, when you got the Ellie Goulding gig and um, your body, the drummer, allowed you the space to experiment. That's when you yeah, really I learned, mean, like. Yeah. So like I'd yeah like it was like it, I was in bands and like jamming with people in London and was playing around with stuff there and like I was in a band with this guy at the time who was writing stuff that he sort of wanted to be like the meeting point of like Perfect Circle, Jeff Buckley and Goldie. So it was like prog metal, singer song writery rock and drum and bass and that was where I really sort of cut my teeth on getting getting real sort of electronic tronic sounds and um in a fun, yeah, funny I mean, way like, like it almost like set you up to be a ideal candidate to be a session bass player like if you had gone to college you would have been focusing on well <laughs> I'm not going to go on a rant because <laughs> sometimes I do you, you would have been learning a lot of jazz stand a lot of yeah. technical bass playing and standards and theory but really what made you employable as a session musician was your your ability to use Ableton, your ability to oh, use yeah. effects and your ear training. The, you kind of fell into that, but it was you got that training because of the career that that brought you on a career path, didn't it? Like Yeah, I mean it was all yeah. I, it was all so fortunate. And then yeah, so then the the big context with Ellie, I mean like I'd I'd met Joe once backstage at a festival, but we had mutual friends. Um and so when he sort of first spoke to me about that it was like he they'd had up until that point they'd had some bass guitar being played by the guitarist the keyboard player sometimes played synth bass and sometimes there was bass on track and he was like what he was really struggling as musical director and as the drummer on that was having bass come from like a consistent source whether that was like a synth bass sound or a bass guitar sound um and he was like getting that to feel good and and so he sort of was like i'm intrigued by the sounds you're getting with a bass guitar and he was like i feel like that uh like relationship between a bass player 
and a drummer there's a certain groove that comes out of that so he was like I'd love to try and replicate that with more of the synth stuff um, and at that point you know like Ellie was really exploring more of those kind of synth sounds and I guess it was like the height of like the whole like Skrillex dubstep thing and she mm. was really in in that scene um, so he was really keen and so he really kind of held that space for me to try that and then the other chat we had around that time was they were looking at changing the way that they ran their like the bits of playback and the way that the keyboard rig was handled on that gig and I'd done I'd done like one gig as a musical director and then had done some other things where I'd kind of looked after like Ableton sessions and stuff like I'd been in bands where I'd I'd built that um and in, in all of those it was much more on all of those projects it was actually less of a we were using it less as playback and more for like live looping um or we'd have samples and with Ableton you can do stuff where you could like if you create a loop it extracts like the tempo from that and so that would then trigger these other elements so it was lots of that that I was doing more with it and more sort of like live live processing of audio um and that sort of first tour I did with Ellie, we were doing bits of that. So her record, like Halcyon, there was a lot of vocal effects on that. And so at the beginning we were like, well, we'll live loop the vocals and we'll do these like stutter effects and things. And so we sort of, Joe and I kind of worked together on building that in a way that made sense. And then kind of as time went on, really playback on Ellie became those vocal effects. We just were like, because it involved her standing still and pressing a button and mm. there's this sort of but you know have someone I, backstage like you know like the big guitar players their their takes trigger their effects would she not have something like that like we i mean we talked about that and then and we did we did play around with automating it and like because you can obviously just set up ableton to do it and i think in the end it was just like do you know what? it's easier to like just either have it on track or not and there's always that sort of balance of working out. I actually listened to a really good podcast that Jamie Liddell does, like hanging out with audio files. And it was like last week he interviewed Alessandro Cortini and he talks about his time in Nine Inch Nails and how he chooses what he performs. And he's like, some of it's about mm -hmm. what's enjoyable and exciting and fun for him to perform and what the like audience will appreciate. And I definitely think I remember there was a time where, like, we on the early gig we were like, you know, that ninety percent of this gig is live. Like, track is just like that swoosh there and that like very particular like vocal effects. But you'd come off the stage and everyone just assumed everything was on track and like. And we realised that as musicians we were all sort of we were so involved in things that you end up you almost end up having to be so stationary on stage mm. that people sort of miss the performance element. And so there was that we sort of had that bit of renegotiating how much we do and and some of the solution that we came to on that was actually not, not we started to do less and it wasn't that the things that we weren't doing we didn't just put them on track actually a lot of it was like actually some of this isn't yes it's needed in the recorded production but maybe some of this doesn't it doesn't need to happen live or um I guess like that point I said earlier about functions it was like actually functionally something else can provide the same energy that the track needs and so I think we had a bit of that with the vocal stuff but that that sort of got us on the on like more of the particular like for me it was like Joe really went deep then on like he has his like whole Ableton for drummers stuff and did that deep dive of like you know having it so that very like highly produced drum tracks can be performed live um mm. with like that particularity of performance and electronic production and the way that the snare on you know any given beat the reverb might be modulated slightly differently and so he has his ways of capturing that and being able to replicate that so it can still be performed um and then i sort of alongside that handled more sort of the keyboard synth side of things and looking at ways of because we would used things like logic main stage before but has like had real issues with like syncing arpeggiators and stuff and mm. clocks it must be scary though like having all your stuff running off laptops 
at yeah. a gig like would there ever be like a catastrophic failure like at a big in a big stadium like or something <sighs> I mean, on, on a gig that size, we were always running like a redundant backup. So there's always like a second. If if your first computer full, like, so like on that, like playback and drum samples are all coming from one computer. And then the keyboard sounds are all coming from another. And each of them have a backup. So if one of them stops working in real time, another one just takes over. So I... I don't even know how much that happened. I mean, we we really sort of over engineered things, and um, like Will Sanderson, who was our playback tech on that, was you know his sort of attention to detail and his sort of desire to make sure that stuff was really robust was you know really helped and served us well because it's like I my around a lot of that stuff, my head's been much more in like the software side of things than it has been on the on the hardware side of that stuff really um so having other people sort of look out for that and and optimizing computers and systems to run well and then for me it's just a case of making sure that the software's like kind of cpu load is manageable and you mm. know and it's like that changes you know oh, it's like being an it out. technician or something and not a musician yeah. after oil and it's and you're having to constantly work it out you know like at the minute it's like live 11 came out at the beginning of the year and you've got like m1 macbooks and stuff and it's all you know like at the minute it's <laughs> that scramble, scramble of like working out how how everything handles mm. that stuff and it's like it, it ends up being like a lot of work in the front but what it means like with for me like the big thing with ableton live is it means that for any sort of keyboard if that's handling all your keyboard sounds over and above something like main stage is there's all the sort of sequencer elements that can happen that means you can have like the clocking of an arpeggiator can be perfect so before i'd worked on gigs and really like everyone had sort of issues with really having to get arpeggiators to stay in time and and so that stuff would just sort of be handed over to track but like especially on like a lot of modern day electronica stuff it's like you really sometimes that stuff's like that maybe like the key the key sound in a chorus um so it was like working on making that stuff live and like i mean like for me like i would then sometimes i do that i mean like, there's also times when like with like a live up up thing i would either just play the 16th notes with a with like a pick and palm muted through some effects to get a synthy sound and weirdly um I guess like in the bass effects thing, Ian Martin Allison's become such like a charismatic figure for sort yeah, he's of brilliant. Te- he's teaching a, he's people that amazing stuff. Amazing on and, Instagram like, with all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, like he just has like I just <laughs> I have zero desire to be that person. I yeah. I just don't have the uh, I think I lack the constitution and the charisma to sort well, of do that. I'm the same. Um, I was thinking about like I'm just me like on social media, and I know Ian is like that in real life. You can tell that. Oh if, yeah. If, if you or me were to go on Instagram and be like, "Hey everyone," and to be all <laughs> <laughs> happy yeah. and char- it, it, he is charismatic in that way. Like, if it's not genuine, people see through it. Like, so no. you need and someone think, like him. And I think he's been able to sort of he's been able to to communicate a lot of that stuff in a way that people can sort of connect. But it was really funny. Like he, I think I remember seeing the first time he put up the video about how he does the. 16th note arpeggiator thing with like a simple delay and I the weird I was like I've been doing that as well (laughs) and it was just one of those weird things where you're like oh these things have sort of it's all sort of been a like everyone sort of been trying to solve the same it's actually very funny that you said that because I was watching um oh what's the bass player Chris Squares um, oh yeah because I'm doing a live stream next week looking at um old instructional DVDs so I was watching a bunch of them before it like and I was watching Chris Squares and he's doing uh, pinch harmonics and he's like he's like I invented you know he didn't say I invented he said I found this out and I do it all the time on the bass I don't know if anyone else in the world does it it's like people just find like if it was these days everyone would just be saying oh that's just pinch harmonics but when he was learning or when you were doing your thing people just find these things like different roads lead to the same thing don't they yeah and i think it's that thing of like i think now you have a greater awareness of it i definitely always had that sense of of like um 
and that's probably for me some of that reticence of like I think there have been times when people have like oh you should do a thing and, and I've always just been like but I everything that I but I, it's that funny stuff because I think I I've had those moments where some of that gets challenged like I think that day of doing that first interview with Juan and being like and it was sort of we did the first half of the interview and then he was like all right we need to take a break and then he was like right anyway for the second part you show me uh like an effects chain that is not not anything i've ever seen before and then he walks <laughs> he walks out of the room and i was like what can i show you that you've never seen there, there's nothing like i was like i've just i just ripped you off <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. everything i do is sort of like stolen from you and and your friends or like these people on forums who I don't know beyond their screen name, who are like, oh, I find this particular fuzz or this particular octave, you know, like I, I just was like, I've taken all of that. And then I think I hadn't, I think in that moment then of, of like with the density Hulk and, um, and that was the thing of like chatting to the guy, like I then got to know the guys at Mantic and, and realizing that actually there weren't, there weren't that many other people using something like the meat box or the density hulk in that in the parallel fashion that i was and i just assumed that there was because it was on the meat you know like the meat box had that built in so i i just assumed that was the way that it was used and i think when i you know i bought one because i'd seen a picture of juan's pedal board and mm. i was like well i'll get one of those and, and when i got it i was like oh there's two outputs and i was like oh i'll use the oh yeah i'll use that in parallel sort of thing um and hadn't you know it was that sort of thing of then, then having that moment with someone and being like well I, i'm and then realizing that actually the way that i had applied it was different to how someone else would and um i think all of that stuff's really interesting but yeah i think i ultimately it's like it's that funny stuff i think now i've i feel like for years i was like trying to find and encourage younger bass players to embrace more effect stuff especially on the session thing and i you know it's that thing of like not wanting to sound too old manish but there's mo there's times at the minute where i feel like <laughs> it's that thing where i'm like i spent so long really wanting to get away from that thing of someone playing clean bass guitar while there's a synth bass on track and and the reality is those things never fully properly align and you end up with phase issues and at some point there has to be a decision made about which one of those things gets pushed Chopped, in the yeah. mix and you know i i remember seeing gigs of people just sort of essentially like playing like live musicians essentially just soloing over a backing track that is surprisingly full and you know like and i i just never had any for me I, ne I that i just have never had any desire to like that to be what music would look like for me um and so like ableton and effect sort of played into that same thing for me where ableton being able to control any parameter you want in a sequenced fashion that is time locked means that means that like that opened up the possibility of me being able to play a synth part with one hand and my other hand tapping out a bass line like that meant that i could have like an octave and a fuzz down and i could do these bass drops on a bass guitar or use a whammy on the bass guitar and so that's like one foot one hand is doing that and then right oh my other hand could play that that up line or my other hand could play that sort of syncopated again like a lot of that sort of electronic influence pop music you know, the bass lines where there's a bass guitar and a synth or maybe two synth parts that sort of bounce off each other mm. and it's like working out how to play that i was and like being able to do that but if, if there's mm. like a filter that needs to open or close with that well ableton can do that i don't need a third hand to turn that knob mm. that's um, interesting yeah and that i think an effects thing that became all of that for me as well it was like well I can quickly change from a bass guitar sound to then this sound and then to that sound and that means that I can and for me that it was all about trying to keep that stuff live and and for the longest time I, I felt like it was hard to find I felt like there were a lot of peers and a lot of people older than me that had been doing that um and I think I sort of had that fortune of certainly at the time that i started doing it with ellie there weren't there weren't many other people on like a gig of 
that sort of scale that were doing the same thing like there are definitely loads of people out there that do it much better than I do um but I, I sort of was hoping like I think I hope that there'd be other people maybe paying attention to it and and then I've had times where I've needed to recommend people for gigs or haven't been able to do gigs and it's really hard to find other people that have done it and and I think it's lacked that I th I think sort of opposite that I've looked at the drum world and drummers have really been embracing having like sample pads and and really kind of grappling with that need of replicating electronic drum sounds and I feel like in some worlds of like and again like it's that session sometimes becomes such a dirty word and I think we sort of assume that that means sort of like colorless or characterless playing and mm. you know people just are like I just need one good bass that I can do every gig with and I think for me it's that chameleon thing that actually my my experience was that never really worked for me and like I, I took my like five string Sadowski active bass to a session once and I also had like a Dan Electro and the guy that I was working with I'd normally take my Dan Electro and a P bass and this session I was like well I've got the Sadowski now that's like my one bass for all occasions and, and obviously for some people that really works but for me like I rocked up and the producer was just like what are you doing this isn't why I called you and um, and like the next day I, like, I sold the Sadowski and and bought a Gibson Grabber so I could be like <laughs> my heroes and um, it it was but I think for me that's been that thing of like um, trying to find a voice on it and, and trying to kind of through that world try and find a way of making that happen and wanting to um, I think wanting other like hoping that there'd be other people that would do that and I feel like what it's needed is is like a figure like Ian who has that passion and that energy for education and has that sort of like just like um overflowing enthusiasm and charisma that... he's just demystifying it as well like I bought yeah. the what's it called the Line 6 HX stamp oh yeah and it's the most challenging pedal i've ever bought like i got nowhere with it well it won't work with my laptop and that was an i mean and i got it working with uh, an imac but like you need someone like ian to explain this stuff because yeah it's way more complicated than music theory or anything in my opinion anyway and I, it's it's a very steep learning curve yeah i i think his ability to communicate that stuff in simple ways is like definitely like i feel like i end up talking because i i've ended up again it was like that thing of because i the fm4 like that purple line six was for me early on was so instrumental in a lot of my synth sounds that i've always sort of been tied to the line six stuff so for ages that looked like the m series and it was like and there are a load of like event you know eventually i had that within like a clean loop switching system which meant that i was able to get away with sort of the tonal degradation that that can lead to on your clean tone so when like the helix stuff came out i was like oh great there's like that step up in quality of sound and um i sort of immediately built a board that was like i centered it around like the hx effects and you can use all the midi of that like i used that with some midi like switches so i could control a bunch of other stuff and i had like the moog um filter pedal and Source Audio, sadly, don't make it anymore, but they used to make, there's this pedal called the Reflex. It was like an expression pedal, mm, but it could send control time. voltage out and you could have presets. And so I could essentially have presets of the Moog filter and just send like the MIDI stuff. But it, so like the, the Helix thing for me is like now become a real like for the synth stuff and, and like sound design stuff. Like now there's things like the shuffling looper and stuff on it. And like, it's sort of like, you can perform with it like a modular synth now and you can do some really weird weird sound and that, that's all the stuff that I get really into and I'm like but that that's useless to like but someone I'd who's like I'm see, trying I'd to work to out see, how to use this I'd love to see you put that stuff up though because you only have a little bit of stuff about it and I was learning a bit like it really would be great to see you put up more of this stuff about like the effects because it's like you said there's not many people doing it I, yeah. you can probably count on one hand the amount of people who've released um, presets he Helix presets and stuff yeah do you know what? it's something i've thought about doing and i it's that thing of like 
yeah i just need to sort of like i've i've actually like had a couple of like interactions with ian on on instagram and he's been like man you should do some stuff and i'm like i just lack the <laughs> like i just lack the i'm too lazy and i lack the motivation i think and i i have that you know like i still despite despite being able to sort of make this work as a job that imposter syndrome for me is still so mm. real that i think i i still really struggle with that sense of like um will anyone <laughs> will anyone care i do um, will. but we all and, everyone gets that i get that like I suppose I'm a rock. I'm a rock bass player, really. But sometimes I put up what, some, you know, a bit more technical stuff. But I'm not that guy either. Like, so I'd be thinking, hope people don't expect me to be playing all this mad stuff all the time. Like, at the <laughs> man, end I love like I'm a I love all that stuff. Like you do when, it, like, pretty much any time you put a video up with that Epiphone, like the Rumble Cat. I'm like, yeah, oh, I, man, love that. I know. Like, I know this is gonna be sick. <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't even know you were following my profile, so that's good. To oh know. man, like I, I think I've been following you. I don't know how I came across you, but I've definitely been following you for about. It was, do you know? It's probably like the algorithm was like, "You'll like this guy." Yeah, yeah. And I Next think slide. the first thing I saw was you doing something with the Rumble Cat, and it's like, I just love old hollow body bases anyway. So it was mm. like immediately I was like, "Oh man!" Like I'm so drawn, drawn to that. And then I think it was like I think quite quickly you were doing stuff with that and an envelope filter. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, love oh, that sound. Like... This so like. Um, yeah and i think that i think it's that thing of actually realizing that there's like an ecosystem that we're all involved in and actually like everyone's experience like we all have our different ways of doing it and i think again i think the danger is and the danger that i've had in the past of of trying to encourage other people to use effects is what i will do is explain my way of doing it and I don't think I'm always that good of really explaining maybe some of the reasons behind it or even like actually taking the time to think about the thing. Like it's all that stuff of like um, things like the Source Audio C4 synth pedal that I use all the time now. But I've like, I was sort of chatting to someone just last night actually about using it and and I use mine, like I have, I sort of have a, and a feedback loop available in mine always so like i patch output one back into input two and so that that's meant that now like i post less of my early on i put a bunch of my sounds on the app because it was like I, when it first came out i was like oh there aren't any presets of all the sounds that i would use like i was like oh, on pop gigs is like i'm always doing like a reese bass sound there's always like that classic like stevie moog like 24 karat magic like synth sound Mm. um like those house housey bass sounds um like good sub stuff and and i was like i'll do those presets and i put those out and like like amazingly like i think a lot of them have seen a lot of use and um i think i've really i've had a few people sort of get in touch with me and be like that's really helped me actually with the pedal like you just put them out for free like you don't get uh, no they're they're just on the yeah they're just on the they're just on the thing i mean like my my relationship with source audio has been really good because it was again when i started doing ellie like they had the hot hand out like that ring oh yeah that um, was didn't really take off too much i've never no but i like i was using it <laughs> <laughs> i think, I think when, I was, like, when the, dubstep went out of fashion the need for a hot end kind of went. i mean i think i was like the only <laughs> i think i was like one of the only people like using it on like a platform so like but it meant that like i developed a really good relationship with them really early on and they were they were super supportive um and and like weirdly actually i used it less for like the filtering stuff and i started to use it more for like delay sends and stuff because it was like it felt really intuitive to be able to sort of like lift your hand and that sort of send a sound to a delay and it was more that sort of just, stuff just that to I explain to for. people what it is because I, I think that piece of technology kind of passed most people by basically you expl- you you explain it since I've never even used one. Yeah, it's like um, it's a ring that has like accelerometer, like motion sensors in it. So like it it knows if you're moving up and down. A ring for right. your finger. That yeah, a ring on, on your, your right finger. Yeah. I mean, you can put it on anything, and then you can move it, and it turns that into like essentially that would then plug into any expression input on any pedal you have to control whatever that would control. Um, weirdly, there's like a new company at the minute. I keep seeing the adverts for that have made the same thing and they sort of keep talking about it as if it's brand new and I saw part of me wants to be like Source Audio did that 10 years ago um, <laughs> yeah, well you find out stuff I found out something amazing there is I was um 
looking up some old uh, Japanese bases like a Tiasto. Did you ever hear of that, Brian? Oh yeah. Uh, it turns out they invented the uh, you know the three machine heads on one side and one on the other about oh, ten, really? year, ten years before Music Man. Even though it's patented to Music Man, that's so. wild. So maybe maybe they didn't know about it, and then sometimes yeah. these things happen. Like I mean, I think and I think that sort of idea of being able to move your like i guess like you have things like imogen heaps made those gloves and things and it's like mm. i think that idea of wanting to be able to translate like spatial movements and gestures into into things that can control stuff it's kind of the future with vr as well like yeah you think about being in a virtual band and that kind of technology could work for that couldn't it like yeah, I think it'd be. Re- I'm intrigued to see where that stuff goes. But yeah, so I was like an early adopter of that with Source Audio, and I think like I used it quite a lot. Um, but that led to like a really good relationship with them. So it is with like things like the the like they sent me a C4 pretty early on, and it uh, they kind of were explicitly like you know we'd love some presets, um, mm. and a lot of them were like ready. A lot, you know, like a lot of them ended up kind of seeing use in demos, and I think partly because they were only like. A handful of sounds like on available at the time on the app but i mean the i mean that that ecosystem of the source audio stuff of being able to like download other patches is like i think that for for sort of bass players or really any like all guitarists as well like anyone sort of wanting to get into making synth sound the source audio platform is a really great way of getting into there because you can like you can download other people's sounds and you can audition sounds and find ones that you like load them into the pedal and from there you can sort of you can reverse engineer you know you can see start to see how people have made their sounds and that's how i've sort of learned everything really um for me it's always been like reverse engineering other things that other people have have done and so i think like even actually that as like a learning tool is really good and um that pedal i really enjoy um and it's it's like yeah like i think that that sort of facility to be able to download the sounds and and see how people have made them and be able to immediately apply them i think that the the one sort of learning curve there is knowing how to set up like the input gain and thresholds on that because a lot of those effects are so um particular to the level and the nature of the sound that's going into them but also like sometimes setting that stuff up wrong is like some of the fun thing but sure, so like, i i found like i was sort of like using the the c4 and i loved it but i always wanted a bit of drive after after the filter and the way that the architecture is and that the drive always comes before the filter and i, I didn't necessarily want to have to use a separate pedal for that and i realized that because it has like two paths that can run in parallel i was like oh i could just feed one back into the okay, other yeah because i would always have a drive before any filter i think yeah. it just makes them sound better but well so like with that then you can like the one pedal can do drive before and after the filter okay and like i, sp- and I suppose in your can... in your mind you think of it like patch cables almost like even though yeah. it's a digital thing you're imagining it's like you have a big cable and you're able to move it around to other parts yeah like that's totally i think like it's i like i have the modular synth and like my first sort of experience with the synth was like the korg ms20 so i think that idea of right at the start being able to patch things and um and like stuff like with the with like the moog model d like the way that people would often like feed the output back into like the mixer thing and create feedback loops is like how you got a load of those like really dirty like moog synth based sounds and that was my thinking with the C4 thing. Actually, when I I first did it, I was less thinking about actually adding some drive internally. Initially, I was like, oh, I wonder if um, I wonder if you can create feedback like you do on the Moog, and you can, and it sounds really cool. <laughs> so, um, it's an experiment. It's, the, it's like, and it, but I was like chatting to someone about it like the other night, and then I was like, oh, this is maybe. <laughs> this maybe is i've maybe gone a bit too fast but like it's that sort of thing that to me i'm like i'm like oh it'll just be great when you start doing this so um <laughs> i think i also could do with it'd be helpful for me to sort of like sit down and work out more effective ways of communicating things but then it's like the laziness of me is like when when something like ian is already doing it and and does it with a degree of sort of enthusiasm and charisma that he is i'm like i don't i find it hard to see the merit in in like in doing that but may- maybe the better way of doing that would be to do 
be more sort of um, like I've, I've done a few things on Instagram in my stories of just like talking through some sounds like I did like <laughs> I like I had a thing of playing around with making a granular sort of I thought I, thought, I found it really useful like, I think I don't think you you would be um, repeating what Ian does like yeah. like said you have your own out, outlook on it like you definitely should yeah. put up more stuff like explaining that thing, that kind of thing yeah I need to just be less lazy <laughs> but it's and complicated it, uh, you, you, you've been doing it for years but like for yeah. someone who doesn't own FX pedal it's like it's a big hill to climb like to get start understanding all that stuff like I mean, ironically, sure. now Helix have a granular delay built into it. <laughs> so that, that like whole patch that I built, I was like, you don't need it anymore. There's just like a there's a block. I think it's the glitch delay block. I was like, it just does it for you now. So <laughs> I was like, well, I'm glad I spent. <laughs> I'm glad I spent that. Like, I mean, like I only really spent sort of like 15 minutes doing that. Like mm -hmm. those videos that I do are always really. I sort of started doing them because I, I'd, every now and then I'll have people be like, oh, you should do stuff, and um. I've had periods of like trying to sit down and and like compose a proper video for it and I'm like I end up just binning anything I do and I was like actually for me it's a lot easier just to do like an Instagram story thing mm. and then pin that to my wall um do you know what would be easier if you just um turned on the screen recorder app on your Ma your Mac mm -hmm. and just did it on the computer That's and talk into idea. the microphone and then your video would be finished and edited in one go like yeah I think I think that would probably be better. I also half wonder if like, I wonder if I'd do better with something like, I'm not on Twitch, but I wonder if something like that, or like the, I wonder if something that could be a bit more um, like conversational where people could be like, oh, like pause me in like the process and be like, what did you just do? Yeah, um, you should. Uh, I'm not on Twitch either. It's kind of complicated to get yeah. started with it. Like YouTube live, maybe something like that. Like. Yeah, I've I've wondered about that being maybe a better maybe being like a better medium within which to sort of do some of that so it'd be more like a master classy sort of thing where um i get like i you know i i really struggle to just remain focused sometimes <laughs> it's like <laughs> just that thing of like being like sticking on the one thing because it was like I'll, I'll be like oh there's that fuzz here and you know next thing i know like i'm sort of like off the off that's the just, deep end that's just a creative like, mindset you know we're all the same like i was <laughs> I mean, I, supposed to be <laughs> fixing a base yesterday and then i decided oh i'm going to make a franken base and i'm i'm drawing like different <laughs> headstocks on, on a different thing like you know. God, amazing i love that though like it's but yeah i think it's sometimes yeah it's trying to like retain that focus and trying to like present something in a digestible fashion for people i mean it's like i'm like like, like yes yesterday on thursday two days ago like i'd I spent two hours of recording. I managed to like my modular synth system is not really set up to do drum sounds at all. And um I recently sort of been like obsessing over like getting really back into like old like warp record stuff and early techno and listening to like Kid A with Radiohead again and, and I was like, oh, I'm sure there's gotta be a way of getting my system to do some drum sounds. And finally on Thursday I managed to like get a drum beat out of it and it it, it came about in this really sort of like odd way <laughs> but it was like I then spent two hours just like recording it <laughs> and I was like everything else I had meant to do that morning like all the like productive stuff I'd, I'd like planned on doing and in my head I was like oh, I'll just spend a bit of time once I've done it I'll switch it off and move on to the next thing and it was like immediately I was like I can't believe this is actually happening and sort of like <laughs> I'd I've kind of my workflow with the modular synth now is is such that like I before I even turn it on I'm recording because I've had too many times when I've like got something to happen from it and then uh don't can't repeat it um and I I mean like I enjoy a lot of that like that's some for me that's some of the effects thing as well like, I think uh, early on where I'd have chosen like bass through effects pedals over playing synth i mean like because i'm a synth head and i love synths as well and but i i have more facility on the bass guitar mm. um and i think my relationship with time is different on bass than on a keyboard instrument to the better um but i also love that effects don't always do what you think they're gonna do like 
there's a, there's always this sort of energy like i always love that element of just not having not being in control of it i yeah. i think that's that thing this last year of realizing i really miss performing i really miss being in spaces and environments that i don't have total control of everything and like an effect system can be that because like whether it's that like a fuzz you know you have like germanium diodes that will behave differently depending on the temperature or the humidity mm. and like on the one hand that could be a problem but on the other hand yeah maybe gig that gig that night the fuzz the like attack or decay on the fuzz was slightly different that night and if that stuff's not like critical and doesn't hamper the performance for me that's the stuff that has enabled me to do like 200 gigs in a year and and it remain interesting because i'm always listening out i'm like oh well if i if i hit the bass a bit harder today and i think you know like there's that physical relationship with the bass guitar that you don't quite have with a synth the part you know like there's some synths now like some of the mpe things and like things like the old like cs80 with like polyphonic aftertouch that are really expressive to the way that you play but for the most part a synth you press a note and it does a thing and actually a lot of the time some of the battle with getting synth sounds out of the bass is having that degree of consistency but also the flip of that is what you can experiment with is all of those minutiae of performing and how that particular combination of effects that you have i mean i think that's what i loved about the whole like pedal and effects you know mm. youtube series was i felt like they really sort of captured some of that yeah, you um, react to it as well like it makes yeah. you play like i have a the digitech synth wow which is a terrible pedal for tracking <laughs> but that is what i like about it because it yeah. makes you do all this weird glitchy stuff but like i can't use it like in a normal sense because it can't track like if you play fast yeah. or do anything like yeah i think it's like once you find that stuff and you exploit it like i think there's that stuff of like what i'd never really seen anyone do before like that trick that um ian allison will do where he hits like a tritone or will hit like two harmonics and on like a fuzz or an octave and it creates that beating effect mm. and i was like i'd have always done that with a tremolo and i was like oh but you can do that with a played thing and you know like it's that thing of like i remember like the first time i saw tim lefave doing like the sort of cycling an oc2 on and off while he was playing yeah so and it's like, was, he, break it he was saying it, i've broken a lot of, of yeah. pedals doing this it's mad but it's like that thing where it totally changes the way you and i think that's the thing that sometimes affects pedals it invite that sort of uh you know like we've all and everyone's had that time when it's like my first delay pedal and you max the feedback and mm. you have like an analog delay and it starts self-oscillating and I think there's something about um i it's funny i wonder if it's changing now with effects pedals becoming more expensive but there was definitely a time with like an old boss pedal they were cheap and easily found and you sort of abused them like they inv they invited sort of a lack of respect mm. whereas like sometimes when you're like presented with a synth there's this sort of um elevation of the instrument that certainly for me at times there's that fear of breaking it or doing something wrong which i don't have for like an old boss or mxr pedal no. um and i mean to my shame even for some of the more like boutique -y stuff i own but i think if i owned like i think if i was like gigging with like some of the chase bliss pedals or you know some of the stuff that you're looking at like three to five hundred pounds of money being spent on i wouldn't i wouldn't have that same sense of like i'll bend down and hit it or like do this or see what that <laughs> yeah, happens yeah. or you like might be I'm, doing that latching effect yeah, like, like i don't want to break the foot switch on this no if i break head. it i'm gonna have to get a loan every <laughs> walk into the house or something yeah. so um yeah so i think i think that's also i guess part of it i think where the effects thing can be really fun is it invites that sort of and i think that's some of the important thing is like um and I guess like coming back to that, listening to the podcast with Alessandro Cortini the other week, he, I felt like he put into words something that I've never really been able to express myself, but like the idea of the performance being fun or enjoyable. And I, I think increasingly now I'm like, yeah, I think that's at a time there was maybe like a youthful pride or arrogance in, in wanting to play everything live 
to the point that probably the performance suffered and the audience appreciation or real comprehension of what was happening actually was lost so the effort was sort of other than being able to like pat myself on the back or scratch my ego and be like oh we made that happen Mm. it really whereas actually what can be enjoyable for me what is an, an enriching thing I think that that has become more my focus now um, and I think probably always was to some extent like I think that that my response to someone being like why did you bring a five string jazz bass that I was like well I'll sell that and I'd always wanted a Gibson grabber and didn't buy one because I didn't think it was an appropriate instrument for an mm. aspiring session musician to have and obviously there must have been something in me that my immediate response to that was like great I'm just going to embrace the thing and that's sort of been what I've done and that or like it's not that like it's not that I enforce my thing on the work that I do like I you know you always have to be respectful and cohesive with the project and the world that you enter into on any given gig but it's my hope is that I have a character or personality that would come come through on it and I think I think I think that's a desirable thing and I think for me when I was younger I wish I'd spent a bit more time on that earlier of just really like but then maybe I wouldn't have got there if I hadn't gone through like the whole thing of like learning crazy like two-handed tapping techniques that (laughs) I just can't I can't even do them anymore it's like no you forget them like when they're not (laughs) you could could try buddy I actually did a a live stream last on Sunday and uh, uh, Scott Whitley messaged me and said hey Steve are you free and he said yeah so it was like an experiment it was me and three other bass players live on YouTube Amazing. and we had to play something we can play from our youth and practice it with a metronome speeding up for an hour and then wow. play it live on YouTube after the hour <laughs> <laughs> oh my god it was horrible oh man that sounds like a roast yeah I don't know it how was, I fit. <laughs> he didn't roast me but it was good it was to show the, the, the listeners or the, the watchers if you will um, how practicing with a metronome slowly and increasing the tempo you can get get better at doing something you couldn't do yeah. before like you know yeah that's definitely a, but yeah, you, I I don't, like, you're not really in the shed I'd say much your your time in the shed is pl- playing music being creative that's for you in the shed yeah I days. think my time in the shed so quickly turns into that I've been I've been a bit better over the last sort of year or two of, of practicing some like studies and doing some metronome stuff again like and really recently i've really got back to that because it's just not playing live as much like i definitely have felt in the studio aware of my time drifting a bit so Mm. i've i've sort of been kind of refocusing on that again and it's been really helpful like it some like thankfully there's that degree of muscle memory that's still there what kind of exercise is just playing whole notes and then stretching yeah like stretching yeah i'd have done I had lessons with a teacher in London when I was like a teenager who did session stuff and he he then sort of introduced me to rehearsal with a metronome that you'd begin with like a metronome on eighth notes and essentially keep dividing it until you're down to one every bar, one every two bar, one every four bars um, and essentially go as low as you can and try and always hit that downbeat. So I do a bit of that and I'll do bits of like maybe there's that like I do I'll do stuff like there's that video of um Carol Kay making the metronome swing yeah that's and so there's brilliant. times when I'll do that and just practice playing around the metronome and making it imply certain rhythmic divisions um I don't really know how to explain it but you can do that thing where you can make it swing or you can make it you can sort of make it feel like it shuffles and so just trying to get into that place of like having some intentionality around that and and there's other things you can do like shift where you hear the click happening so whether it is on the one or whether you maybe hear it on the two and the four and um things like that all sort of quite helpful things and like changing your relationship with practicing with a metro and so like i think that now it's like if i do any practice it's all at the minute it's always with a metronome Mm, it's um, funny because a lot of uh, people coming up or who want to get really good at bass, they never do stuff like that. They're doing all fa- fast scales. But I saw Michael League does that exact mm. kind of thing as well. Like you know, it's really the fundamentals like you're working on. Like, yeah, I think I'm not. Yeah, I I would say without 
I think for me it's always like I I I wouldn't have practiced in the past because I saw it as just do, I thought of it as just doing scales or practicing things and that that didn't have any that didn't seem like it had any relevance in my mind like it was all about context and metronome at least gives you context um mm. and I think similarly for me it's like I wouldn't practice harmonic ideas on bass without things I guess like guys like Yannick would do that stuff with like an electro harmonics freeze pedal or whatever where you create some sort of tone that you can play around and um like the last year there's i feel like there's been a real like explosion of people wanting like fretless bass performances on records and stuff so mm. i've been doing a lot more of that how was your fretless bass playing had you done it wasn't it great a year ago <laughs> <laughs> the intonation really goes doesn't it like yeah i, I, I mean, have one and i've only used it once for every album so very yeah. rarely <laughs> I like I I had like this weird thing where I felt like probably like like five out of ten calls I was getting were like fret, involved fretless in some way and um, as like an artist in Belfast I've been doing a load of recording work and probably like seven out of ten tracks on that have at least fretless on and and then I I you know that sort of got to a point where I was using fretless a lot as sort of extra layers or in like productions then increasingly using it for like ambient tracks and um stuff but yeah I, at the beginning my intonation on that was was wasn't great and the like the gift of remote sessions is you can fix all the tuning <laughs> before you send it to someone <laughs> they're so like, like someone doesn't like, necessarily guy, need to know simon's better than pino paladino on the fretless <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, this guy's amazing and i'm like little do you know um <laughs> But I, I found a lot of playing over drones or having having like a single thing. And I would have done that in the past for like learning sort of like harmony and interval stuff and learning the way that um, each value of a scale relates with the tonic. Um, and with fretless, it's sort of that you then always have something to compare your intonation against. Mm. And it's those ways of like finding a way of it feeling enjoyable. And for me, that might be like creating a loop. Well, that might be coming in here and setting up a synth, just droning and just playing along to that. So I've tried, I've tried to do more of that. Partly because, like this guy up here, I will have to do some, like I will have to play some of that stuff live at some point. So <laughs> I, I've had <laughs> you, that. You really won't like, have auto tune like, at the gig, like <laughs> yeah. And it's like the bass that I've that I was recording was like an unlined fretless Gibson Ripper. So it's like it's a 34 and a half inch scale so it's a weird scale length and there's no lines mm. and i was like man i playing this is going to be a roast um so i man i have actually managed to get hold of like a lined fretless bass but it's um it's a short scale hollow body lined fretless bass so it's <laughs> like i'm not making it easy for myself but no. um but actually like already already kind of having a lined thing like weirdly i think i'm i've always I've always been that annoying bass player that uses like four or five basses on a gig if I can get away with it because mm. I love the way that they all sound and that has meant like again like the grabber is like 34 and a half inch scale and then I'd have generally had like a Yamaha BB which is like 34 inch and I'd always have had a short scale which would have either have been like 30 uh, inch usually isn't there something yeah around. which would have been like a Fender Mustang or a Serac Midwestern which would be like the big thing I use now and I've always been sort of I've never really had any issues changing changing between them like the scale lengths has never been and I, I can't explain why because I know other people that really throws them off or like mm. changing neck profiles I'm not I feel like there's times when I feel like I'm blind to neck profiles like other players will be like oh it's a C shape or it's a yeah. and I'm like it just feels like a neck I think the 24 fret is I found yeah. more weird than the scale length you know if you're playing an extended yeah. range bass feels more strange than any of the other ones with different scale lengths like yeah I mean again I think it's that thing because I think I always was swapping between like weirdly like I fenders are the things that I would have probably played and still now sort of play the least um and the way that you know like a thunderbird or a grabber or something sits so i think i've just got very used to that so i think th thankfully despite the fact that my two fretless spaces are sort of a bit weird it seems to be the two are sort of working quite well so like i feel like my intonation's got a lot better but th I, there's still a lot of work but 
I think there's also that thing where sometimes it's really hard when you're in it, where you're the person performing, you'll be really aware of your time being out or you'll be really aware of your intonation being out. And if you can, like, again, I think maybe for people rehearse, like rehearsing or practicing, recording things can be really helpful because sometimes when you listen to something back, it can go one of two ways. Sometimes it sounds shitter than you thought, but actually sometimes it sounds sometimes that intonation that you thought was awful actually isn't as bad as you thought mm. or sometimes that yep. timing that you thought wasn't great actually is is good or being um, out of tune is part of playing the fretless anyway yeah like, you know, yeah get i mean that, and that's the thing as well actually like that sort of the idea of pitch as a dynamic as like a as a dynamic element because on a fretted bass you're so used to like pitch being fixed and mm. that that definitely is also some of it as well but um yeah you have a Seric behind you. That's Jake Seric, yeah. is it? American dude yes. makes them. Uh, yeah, I have this guy. I, I only heard of them because of Ian Allison. And they oh, look yeah. Awesome. Like. I got this. This arrived like day one of my rehearsals with Kylie. And it was like this and the Yamaha were my main bases for that. Um, I didn't have. It was just like the B90. Yeah, yeah. You modded it. Um, yeah, which was. <laughs> I got a guy. I'd say I, he was loving um, you for that. He's like this is my pro- my baby and then your you know what, like, the I, in it. <laughs> I messaged Jake before I did it I, I, I sent him a message that look I'm thinking I was like someone I know is selling like an old vintage gold foil bass pickup and I was like I think it'd be amazing in the Seric at the neck position and I was like I just want to make sure you're cool with me doing that and he like Jake was like yeah definitely do it that's a great idea <laughs> um and yeah I, I, that bass I'll like that I'll take that bass to the grave with me you got that direct like, from him like he's only like one guy running the company yeah so you, like, you have to email him and uh, all yeah that like crack. I think there's like four or five of them maybe working there now I think at the time that I got it there were only a handful of people um yeah and he I was he was over for like the London bass guitar show and I saw him then and the the bass was in transit to me at that time so we kind of got to hang out and shared a bunch we shared like a bunch of like psych rock playlists and um, <laughs> all the good stuff and then yeah and then like my bass arrived like the day after he left and awesome. um yeah and like straight straight to work and um i love it it just i i've not i don't have another instrument that has the same it's a it just is really dynamically responsive has mojo um, like has serious mojo doesn't yeah it just feels yeah like it's been a bass for a really long time the moment you get it so um well mine mine certainly does um yeah like i i couldn't i couldn't love it anymore like it just and it's been way more versatile than i ever thought it would be and mm. I've, I've had lots of other short scales but that one just yeah i mean like it it was the first bass that i ever managed to use for like a whole ellie golden gig without changing like normally that gig i would have at least had a long scale and a short scale to cover and like a long scale with rounds and flats on the short and then like the other revelation with Seric was that it came with the Jim Dunlop flat wounds that mm. while they're not as thumpy as like a labella they can get a more old school tone but with the tone knob up they're something a bit more modern and I found with that bass they work really well and I can kind of cover all sorts of um, sounds with it so it's been really good yeah class man sure uh i think we've covered everything that was yeah <laughs> that was a, an epic one um yeah sorry it was I, quite long isn't it yeah it um, was good because we got we we were kind of trying to find a date that suited us both for a long time so i think it was definitely good that we waited to find a, a morning that we had we weren't in a rush to go anywhere like yeah no it's been good where should people check you out is um is Instagram your main spot to hang out? Yeah, Instagram is. Pro- I'm not. I'm pretty terrible, but Instagram is probably the main spot. Yeah, just Cy Francis, um, S I F R A N C I S. Yeah, I'm on there, and yeah, if you have any questions about anything, I'm always like, I'm more than happy to geek out about anything. Cool. Uh, yeah. I, so, like, if. Yeah, jump on. I try to like post things. I mean, look at the minute most of my, most of my like, it's like summer holidays, so I'm looking after the kids a lot, and then, um, and then yeah, working on a bunch of sort of production projects that 
we'll be starting to see the light of day soon i mean uh, so that'll be that'll be fun so like there's a lot if you like like watching videos of weird synth sounds and me getting excited because i've got a modular synth to sound like a drum when it shouldn't um yeah check me out and like harass me to put up more effect stuff because i definitely I want to see more because I, I i'm selling my um line six thing if i can't figure it out to use it properly so oh well i'll be like i'll try and endeavor to do more yeah um, do more on that then yeah like i i i love mine and it's like i it kind of was like one of those things that i thought would be more utilitarian and then as someone that loves making weird noises they keep just releasing more and more stuff that can get super weird yeah the aftermarket service is phenomenal in fairness yeah. like it's not as if yeah. they just made this pedal and forgot about it like yeah i mean it's like three times the pedal it was when i bought it and like i didn't even get onto it that early like i feel like i was relatively late to the game but um yeah and it can't like because i you know it can be a midi controller for everything as well that if you're if you're that minded that you want a really sort of integrated effect system and an easy way of controlling things and it's like what i love about it is you can do and it maybe is the thing that probably be worth showcasing is you can do like momentary stuff so like um it means like something like the tim tim lefave oc2 thing you don't have to be going up like that you can just every press down is on in the moment mode or something is that what it's called yeah so like you half the number of times you hit it because it can be momentary on and off and i think things like that for me it's become actually like a really fun creative tool and you can have like momentary stuff to like max out delays or do all sorts of it it's i found it a much more a much more expressive instrument than i thought a multi-effects would be mm. um, it's great that you're like you're a family man but you have the time to like kind of dwell in your creative juices a bit like that's really important i think isn't it like yeah. it, it's not as if you need that time don't you to really explore this stuff yeah i think i yeah i i really obviously your time is probably very limited like with two kids tonight <laughs> but i mean it's like it's you know it's we're again we're really lucky like we have family here like my my sort of in-laws are, are amazing and we we have so much support from them that you know has facilitated me being able to tour and and do all of that and you know um my wife works a busy job as well so it's like it's kind of like again, again it's been like a fun like this last year I, i've sort of been it's been amazing being able to be around a bit more and like both have more of that family time, but also like have a bit more time for that, like creative. Yeah. I think for me being able to put, being able to have this space and able to kind of sort of have that opportunity of like create some chaos and just, um, that's sort of my favorite, that's my favorite place to be. And, um, so yeah, if like, you're a teenager again in your bedroom, yeah. you know, all your toys, it's like, and you know, it's that thing, because I feel like I've I had those conversations with people, they're like, you know, would you do more musical direction? And like the reality is I just don't want the responsibility. Like, and even a bit sometimes with like taking on production projects and stuff, it, it's fun. But actually for me, a lot of that's actually is working out in kind of co-production stuff. And there's a guy here, Matt Weir in Belfast, and he and I have ended up working on, like the majority of stuff I'm working on is with him. And like, you know, selfishly, partly that's because it, it means I can, it, he can be a bit more responsible <laughs> about, about looking after things. And like my, my like great joy is just being able to be like sort of sound boxy and, um, and like I have like hours and hours of sort of like found sounds I've got. And like, um, I like, I mean, I was playing with like the, a marble run that my kid has and it's wooden. And, um, and you know, I probably, I recorded like, half an hour of it <laughs> sampling, already... sampling his tires yeah well i've started to sample it and i'm like putting it through the modular synth um to sort of kind of reimagining it it like yeah you could definitely um, do something cool with that like. yeah but it's like that sort of stuff i'm always... so like it's like any for me it's like that freedom of being able to to do that and find ways of applying it and i don't i don't have any like um I don't have like an artistic drive in the sense of wanting to be an artist. Like I think um, I really enjoy facilitating other things for other people. And um, I don't, 
I don't have any great need to have like a solo project or anything. So it's like, for me, it's like being able to explore that stuff and maybe find a way of presenting that in a way that could be like stimulating or inspiring to someone else or like help elevate someone else's creative goal. And I feel like both as like a performer and then in the studio, that's been like my big, that's the thing I love doing is like much more than like I'll make noises and sounds and beats and whatever in the studio, but I, I don't like, I don't get as much joy out of that as like that moment when you play something weird to someone and then they have a song idea come off of it. And, um, and I'm trying to be disciplined and try to play less on the things that I produce and try to let go of that control. Cause it's like, I, I, I just love getting to hear other people do things and interpret something in a different way that I wouldn't anticipate or, but that I think chaos for me is like what I, is like the source of creativity for me, like limited chaos, <laughs> and then trying to like wrangle it into something that makes some sense. So really, you know, I, I can see you doing a bit of production, getting into that more, like producing bands and stuff. Like you yeah, have the right yeah. um, uh, mindset for it. I think. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to. I think it's like, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, there's some stuff coming out, so hopefully it'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> and people will be happy with it i think i like i like the stuff yeah, that, sure, you'll get some more work in that <laughs> um but yeah like it's that thing where there's there's always that bit of being like again it's that imposter syndrome as well of like you sort of have to choose you almost have to call yourself something and then embody it and and do it and there's always that sense of like am i just blagging but blagging it but um sure that's like yeah. we're, we're blagging we blag our way through everything like i know well like, that's it <laughs> I wish I, knew, I wish I was in Belfast because uh, there's this uh, nice place that does a 24 hour breakfast near the Empire Music Hall. I don't, oh, is know, it? I don't know what it's called, but all, every time we play there and we get there before it's closed, amazing breakfast. <laughs> Perfect. Well, next time you're next time you're up this way, give me a shout and um, we should. Well, yeah, you. I might pop to your studio. We could film some. Uh, oh man, like definitely. I bring I bring my camera and do all the crack. Yeah, man, you'd be welcome anytime. That would be. That'd be great. Um, yeah. Well, let's make that, let's try and make that happen because I'm around loads at the minute. So, brilliant. Um, yeah, I'd really enjoy that. Any excuse to make noise. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. But I'll not take up any more of your time. We're like, we're pushing like three hours of your day. So, um, don't worry about it. This is great. I love the long ones. <laughs> well, I'm going to sign off now. So, oh, I'll just yeah. turn off the recording.